Good evening. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's indeed a, a great pleasure for me to welcome you all for this unique program, which is organized on the behalf of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association in association with the Indian Orthopedic Association and especially for celebrating the Bone Joint Week. 4th of August, as all of us know, is the Bone and Joint Day for the Indian Orthopedic Association. And we are happy that we are commemorating that day as a part of this MOA masterclass. So this masterclass idea was uh, the brainchild of our president, uh, Professor Ajit Shinde, which started more than a year ago and has been continuing quite religiously through all the Sundays uh, in the last uh, 14 months. And uh, today is uh, the Arthroplasty masterclass. And I welcome uh, our president, Professor Ajit Shinde, our dynamic secretary, Professor uh, Narayan Karne, and uh, also the most uh, coveted person today and the most busy person today. For the last one week, I think he has a record number of 80 uh, webinars who he, he has attended. Our president, Professor uh, B. Shiv Shankar, uh, welcome, sir. And uh, our MMC observer, who is Dr. Nitin Bhagli, who is also from the city of Pune and a very eminent orthopedic surgeon in Pune. I welcome you, sir. So uh, thank you for joining in. And uh, Professor Rami Soriel, who is going to be our first uh, uh, speaker. Uh, welcome, Professor Rami Soriel. Uh, before I introduce you, I wish to hand over the proceedings to Professor Ajit Shinde, President of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association. Professor Shinde, sir. Good evening, everyone. I am Professor Dr. Ajit Shinde, President of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and Organizing Chairman of IOCON 2021. I welcome you all for today's masterclass to celebrate Bone and Joint Week. Every Sunday, MOA is conducting academic activity under the title of Masterclass on various topics in orthopedic to upgrade knowledge of every MOA member. Actually, in this month, we are supposed to have master classes on arthroplasty, TKR and THR. But considering coincidence of bone and joint week, we combined both the activities with the involvement of eminent faculties who are renowned arthroplasty surgeon at the same time are great personality thinking beyond our profession. Indian Orthopedic Association was founded in 1954 but actually registered on 4th August 1971. So we at Indian Orthopedic Association observe and celebrate 4th August as a bone and joint day. And whole week from 1st August, we celebrate as a bone and joint week every year. This was initiated in 2012 by the, the then IOA president, Dr. Raj Shekran from Koyimtu. Every year, IOA president declares his theme and on that basis, various activities and programs are conducted all over India at state, district and city level. Specific marks are granted by IOA for each activity and on that basis, awards are given to the first three highest scorers. This year, the presidential theme of Dr. Shiv Shankar Present president is save self and save one. The basic idea of IOA president, Dr. Shiv Shankar, is that orthopedic surgeon should first save himself, his family from various stress and stress which he has to bear throughout his life, be it professional, academic, financial, social, legal, like CPA and assaults. Sometimes doctors are assaulted from unsatisfied patients or their relative. In spite of all these things, one should enjoy satisfied, successful, healthy, wealthy social life. Thus, IOA has designed and included following topic for webinar throughout the work, throughout the week. Work-life balance, life beyond professional life, financial health, self-health, and stress buster. Yesterday evening, we had lecture on first two topics by Padmasri Dr. K. Sanchiti Sir and Dr. Shiri Spatter and other topics we had lectures on previous days in this week. This knowledge is supposed to help for the betterment of 
oneself, colleagues, friends, family members, and to have a harmony in life. In addition to that, two more topics are added. One, basic life saving training program for students, youngster, policeman, and common man. And of course, for us, learn and remind us regarding prevention and management of casualties of road traffic accident. For prevention of road traffic accident, reducing mortality, morbidity, every one has to follow all traffic rules and regulation. Another topic is spreading awareness about a healthy board. Today's faculties are going to share their knowledge for our betterment. First, Professor Dr. Rami Soriel from Sydney updating us on robotic TKR, while second faculty Bharat Modi renowned joint replacement surgeon from Baroda is going to share his wisdom on 10 labors of Hercules, how to build a hospital. And third faculty, Dr. Vijay Bose, who is again renowned joint replacement surgeon from Chennai, acknowledges us on understanding diet and exercise to optimize benefit. I welcome them all today, them all and our president, Dr. Shiv Shankar, Today's um, and observer Dr. Bhagli. Today's convener Dr. Parak Sanchete is going to introduce every faculty. My best wishes for these webinar activities, which is already got MMC credit points. All these four webinars in this month are got MMC points. Friends, it is almost finalized that we are going to have IOCON 2021 physical. I request all the members to cooperate and participate wholeheartedly to make it grand successful. Very soon, we are going to declare you venue and dates. Thank you very much. Jai IOA, Jai MOA. With this, I hand over this mic to today's convener, Dr. Parag Sanchiti, for Thank further you. proceeding. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shinde, for having uh, given an introduction about the bone joint week about the MOA activities, as well as uh, the theme of the Indian Orthopedic Association president. With this, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, our uh, very dynamic and very busy president, Professor B. Shiv Shankar from Sholapur, Maharashtra, India, uh, who has uh, been really taking charge of this society in difficult times. But I must say, Professor Shiv Shankar, you have done a wonderful job in spite of all the odds and uh, difficulties you have faced because of the pandemic, you've come above them, you have scored, and you've come as a winner. So with these few words, I want to uh, request Professor Shiv Shankar to say a few words on this occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Parag Sanchetti, for uh, the nice introduction, as well as uh, conveying this uh, today's program. Welcome, uh, Professor Dr. Rami Suryal, Professor Dr. Bharat Modi, and Dr. Vijay Bose. My hearty congratulations to MOA President, Professor Dr. Ajit Shinde, and Dr. Narayan Karne. And I welcome Dr. Nitin Bagli, the MMC Observer. And I welcome all the people who are watching this Masterclass live today with the celebration of uh, uh, Born and Joint Day week. Yes, definitely it is now to celebrate. I must congratulate the whole CSRC team headed by Dr. Anup Agrawal from Lucknow, Dr. Mohan Mantri uh, from Irkota, Dr. Ompal Sharma, then Dr. Anthony Vimal Raj, Dr. Madhu Sudan Kumar with mentor Dr. Ramesh Babu. Uh, they did a wonderful job. I must thank each and every EC member of IOA, especially the presidents and secretaries of each state who took the responsibility to share the bone and joint day materials prepared and provided by IOA side to each and every district, as well as to each and every member. I thank each and every orthopedic surgeon from across India for taking this uh, activity to such a great level and probably everybody is celebrating this as a um, festival activity the whole week. I've been getting so many reports from across India. Friends, as you all know, the program kick-started on 1st August. And on the first day itself, Dr. Mohan Mantri gave this 
trauma basic life support talk to over 15000 students from allen coaching class with students from across india joining midway th- through the week we had dr madhusudan kumar from bihar orthopedic association he had arranged talk of president of bihar orthopedic association dr sn saraf for the students of bihar state and the involvement of education secretary of bihar mr sanjay kumar and this was also attended by large number of students and the count we are not yet got the count but our guess is around 5 lakh people students from different school attended and they were benefited by this uh, recently the delhi orthopedic association also arranged had arranged a talk by president dr lalit mani to all the navodaya schools and over 2.5 lakh students attended this virtual presentation and they have given a congratulatory message they have sent to ioi also the final yesterday was at gujarat it saw over 10 lakh people probably it is around 15 lakh we are not yet got the report it logging to 76000 instruments across gujarat simultaneously for an excellent talk on basic life support for accidental victims by our past president of ioi dr pravin kanavar thanks to our ioi secretary dr navin takkar for coordinating this uh, Uh, education activity to education secretary of gujarat dr vinod rao and through sarva shikshan abhiyan to transmit this program live to over 33000 schools and to over 10000 police stations across gujarat it was a befitting panel for bone and joint week celebration and i am glad that we have achieved the target set by us and we have surpassed the target at least by 20 times Uh, i know that once the report comes starts coming we will know how many people have benefited but initially we had thought of preparing a battalion of 1 lakh people uh, to get trained in this but at present we have reports of over 20 lakh people getting the benefit out of these uh, different talks from across india this whatever i figure i am quoting it has not even included the uh, report from maharashtra as of yet because we have not received the report so far i must thank moe my own parent association led by dr rajesh shinde and dr narayan kade i even attended their uh, state district association uh, meet and i know how meticulously dr narayan kade had planned the activity in the state and he even reminded the district which were lagging behind midway through i know about that also i have seen the response from pune sangli ahmednagar bid and solapur personally as i attended few of them and narayan kane has shared the pictures through whatsapp finally i must congratulate dr parak sanjeti too for coming this meet as well as for the yesterday's uh, program by past ayo president dr h santeji sir and to and also uh, dr shirish yeah. patak the uh, shirish patak and to in uh, to and we are meeting to inform all the success activity today i will not be able to acknowledge each and every one of you but thank to each and every one for having taken major or minor uh, uh, responsibility and actively participated all throughout the week and taking this to a wonderful level i am sure in the last 12 year 10 years since we have been celebrating the bone and joint uh, week probably this is the first time that all the orthopedic surgeon united in such a way and celebrated in a such a grand manner thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you for briefing us with the activities of the week and it's really uh, very uh, uh, happy and really a good thing to know that in spite of all these things you've been able to set records it's very heartening to know this uh, thank you professor shiv shankar now uh, uh, i now request dr karne our secretary of moa who is also the treasurer for the indian orthopedic association annual meeting to be held in goa goa to say a few words and then we go to the talk so professor karne sir thanks professor parak sir for uh, uh, giving this opportunity and while uh, uh, convening this uh, very important moa master class uh, there are two uh, occasions one is a bone and joint decade which our uh, honorable president of the indian orthopedic association dr uh, professor shivashankar sir has already elaborated only one thing i want to uh, tell uh, professor rami about this that is the difference between golden hour management in the western countries and in india 
you know in the past we were giving all the lectures and we were teaching training the doctors of all the specialties and general practitioners for how to give the golden hour treatment but in india the situation on the roads is not like western that there is a uh, helicopter ambulance and you can get the medical help within few minutes or you can say uh, in a short time but in india it takes sometimes half an hour to one hour to get the medical help so what we decided uh, these are brain child of our honorable president dr shivashankar that will train the common man who is on the road another thing is that uh, in schools it is not taught in western countries this particular subject is taught to the students in the schools but in india it is not to the, uh, told to the students rather 75% of the population is not aware what to do when the accident arrive, uh, uh, occurs and even they are at the spot so professor shivashankar has given us such a wonderful idea to train all the persons right from the school ages to the colleges and a common man and teach them how to treat the patients till the medical help arrives and this gave us little tremendous boost and the it is a great social efforts we have to congratulate and thank our professor uh, president dr shivashankar secondly dr ajit shinde has also elaborated about this particular concept the master class the idea of the master class is that we have got the spe- spe- specialists who are doing dedicated joint replacements but in maharashtra or even india at least 80% orthopedic surgeons are general orthopedic surgeons so they want to know they are doing everything right from the fracture fixation to uh, scopy or even some do uh, a scop- a plastic as well as the spine so the basic idea of this master class is to uh, tell this very fell orthopedic surgeons to know how where the world has gone ahead that is uh, as uh, professor ram is going to tell about the robotic tech care and how the basic things also can help the way dr vijay bose is going to tell us so i thank uh, professor parak sir for elaborate uh, for forming such a wonderful panel and on behalf of maharashtra orthopedic association i welcome all the faculties and our moi observer also dr nitin bagli thank you very much thank you thank you very much uh, karne sir you have really taken moi to places in the last one year we are seeing the great work you are doing but now uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, our first keynote speaker and uh, the first oration which will be given by none other than professor rami soriel professor rami soriel uh, is not a new face to india uh, i would say he's half indian because he's been to india so many times and he knows almost all the arthroplasty surgeons in india and through uh, apas asia pacific arthroplasty society he has made inroads into india he has made very close friends and uh, i wish to welcome him he is uh, also been a past president of uh, the asia pacific arthroplasty society he was the current scientific chairman of, of the largest arthroplasty meeting held in the world for arthroplasty with more than 100 faculties more than 15 live surgeries and didactic lectures debates as well as symposiums he is also uh, heading the department uh, of orthopedic surgery at the napian hospital uh, he is also an adjunct professor uh, at the university of sydney he sits on many uh, examinations and fellowships he is uh, also uh, written many chapters and has many articles to his credit in peer reviewed journals but most importantly he is a friend of india he is a friend of the indian orthopedic association friend of maharashtra orthopedic association he has been to pune has been to maharashtra and he is really a person who is helping promote arthroplasty uh, to uh, the indian fraternity by making us available the cutting edge technology so talking about cutting edge technology everybody is now talking about robots everybody is interested to know about robotics and everybody is having a little bit of doubt in their mind whether the robots work or they don't work so for this purpose we have none other than professor rami soriel who has seen the entire curve he's done thousands of knee replacement without a robo he is now using the robo so i don't think there would be a better person than professor rami soria to speak to us on the robotic tkr the past the present and the future so may i request and may i welcome professor rami soria with this few words to this uh, great occasion of the celebration of the uh, bone and joint week of ioa and the moa maharashtra orthopedic association master class over to professor rami soria welcome thank you parag thank you very much for that um, very nice welcome um i have been to pune and i certainly enjoyed wonderful hospitality um and certainly got to so- see the core inside of the sanchetti institute it's been i believe maybe 3 and 1/2 years since i was there so i think it's due for another trip but 
Obviously, we've got to wait until lockdown, uh, certainly lockdown on the east coast of Australia, which is keeping us all very quiet at the moment uh, with closed borders. We've got to wait for that to um, pass over. The pandemic has certainly been a global phenomenon that's affected many. And um, we're all hoping and praying that uh, within the next six months, we may see better light for everybody. I am uh, very happy to discuss this topic. I'm going to share my screen here as I um, open up for you a presentation which I've labelled um, after speaking with Parag, uh, My Journey to Robotic TKA. Now, the reason for that is um, I've been asked to talk about robotics and the question that um, Parag has posed is basically, do robotics work? The answer is yes. Okay. However, what I thought I'd share with you um, in this presentation is my journey with knee arthroplasty over the past 25 years. It's um, been an interesting journey, and it also allows me to share with you how I've transitioned from different instrument platforms, different implant platforms, um, to give you some insight possibly into you as a young orthopedic surgeon or even someone who's in an early established practice, that what you're doing now is not necessarily what you'll be doing in 20 years or 25 years. If you are in a young practice, you will enjoy transitions over the next two decades, which will see you in a different place, doing a different implant, using a different instrument platform. And that is a very exciting journey. Um, nothing stays still forever. Everything does move forward. And by sharing this with you, I'll at least let you have some insight, hopefully, into what may possibly happen in the future. I'm just seeing if we can, here we go. Before we start this, um, just my declarations. And I only put this up because obviously we're talking about robotics. Um, and I do have some declarations you need to be aware of, particularly some educational consultancy with Zimmer Biomet. And I'm currently the Chief Medical Advisor Asia Pacific for Zimmer Biomet. And the robot that I will be discussing later in this presentation um, happens to be the one from Zimmer Biomet. So just to make you aware of that. Okay, so in short and in the capsule, my experience. Conventional instrumentation since 1996, which is really when I started practice as a consultant in my own right, I was using the cemented PFC. Transition to cementless TKA with a dual fixed tibial tray within a few years. The sign navigation was introduced and I started using that in the noughties as they call it for a few years. I then transitioned to the signature patient specific instrumentation. Once it was established in Australia in 2009, we were early uptakers, one of the first, and it became the mainstay of my practice for nearly 10 years using the Vanguard total knee replacement at that stage. I subsequently transitioned to robotic TKA in late 2019. December was the first procedure with the ro robot that I used. That was the Rosa robot. We've performed now over 170 rows of robotic TKAs using the Persona total knee arthroplasty as the implant platform, all of which have been cementless. During this presentation, I'm going to share with you the transition as we went from one to the other, why the benefits, the downsides, and hopefully give you some insight into how my practice has gone over 25 years and what you may anticipate. But it, everything is based on this principle. But the aims of any arthroplasty surgery, regardless of the technique and philosophy, is to implant the prosthesis in the correct position, then allow the chosen alignment, whatever that may be, mechanical alignment, kinematic, adjusted kinematic, individualized, whichever you may choose, along with soft tissue balance to result in a successful outcome. I'm gonna start by introducing a case. I've called it the knee conundrum. And you may be wondering if this is a presentation on knees, why I'm showing an X-ray of a pelvis, but you know, one is connected to the other. This was a 64 year old gentleman. He had a left hip replacement that I performed. It was an EABG2 cementless 16 years prior in 2004. I then did a right hip replacement in that circumstance in 2009. I put an ABG2 femoral component, but in that circumstance, I used a modular neck, which was very, uh, it was new and it was popular at that time because it allowed you the ability to account for more coxa vera or coxa valga as it presented and have a better soft tissue platform. Um, the tried modular neck system, it was called back then. He had good function for many, many, many years without any problems. 
He worked as a mechanic. He was a laborer. He lifted heavy things. And it wasn't a problem until December 2018, he presented with acute right groin pain, fever, and a raised CRP. We aspirated his hip joint. 200 mils of fluid, parallel fluid, was evacuated from ileus psoas bursa. Cultures, they grew some strep millery. And initial thought is this was an infection and a um, hip lavage with exchange of the femoral head and liner was performed. The modular neck was left in situ, it wasn't removed. But this gentleman continued to have problems and here's an MRI scan. Um, and what is notable here is the extensive amount of amorphous material around the proximal aspect of the femur, the posterior aspect of the hip joint. This amorphous material is akin to the sort of material you would see with metal um, changes. So he had a modular neck. Essentially, he developed a taperosis and a metal problem with an allergic reaction. And the sciatic nerve, which is arrowed here, has become involved in that whole extensive process that he developed prior to a two-stage revision that was being planned, an acute sciatic nerve palsy with a perineal component being lost, and he developed a foot drop. It was decided then to do a two-stage revision to remove the implants. Histopathology confirmed a lymphocytic reaction. Infection was not the cause for his failure. There was no further pus or fluid collection. We did a two-stage revision. That whole process has been over the past year and a half to two years. The reason I present him is throughout all of this, when he presented with his hip problem, he also had a knee problem on that same side. He had a severe valgus deformity of the knee. He had a stiff knee. You can see the marked osteophytes both anteriorly and posteriorly. He had difficulty ambulating. This is also the side that he has the foot drop. So here we have a gentleman who's got severe problems with his knee. He's got revision hip surgery that's occurred over a period of one year. One initially thought to be sepsis, then thought to be a reaction to metal implants. Um, and then he's in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic. So the decision-making process of when to, when to intervene for his knee and how to intervene is part of the problem. So I'm gonna leave it at that and I'll come back to this case at the end but it'd be interesting for you to go through a process of when you would intervene once you've resolved his hip problem and how would you approach this severe fixed deformity, valgus deformity um, with lack of flexion in correcting his deformity and giving him some sort of a function knee joint. So successful total knee requires a number of things. It needs appropriate component sizing, component alignment has to be correct and that's worthy of extensive discussion. Soft tissue balancing has to be secured and now more than ever, we need to discuss that, particularly with the introduction of robotics. Patella has to track centrally and the components have to be fixed for longevity. And that can introduce the argument of whether you use cement or non-cement. That isn't the gambit of this presentation that's worthy of another presentation on its own. Suffice to say, I do use predominantly cementless fixation, but I put that in as part of the algorithm that you need to decide on in selecting your implants. So you may well ask, why did I use PFC Sigma when I first started practice in 1996? I was fortunate enough after my training in Sydney to attend fellowships. I did two fellowships. The first one was in Phoenix, Arizona, and the second one was in Boston, Massachusetts. And of course, my exposure there, being a J&J &J fellowship, was to the PFC need. And certainly in Boston, I got to work with the designers of the PFC knee. So it was fairly straightforward that after that sort of exposure over well over a year, I'd come back doing the PFC. And that I did for a good 12 years of my initial practice. And the reason is that it was an implant that was sound. It was an implant that worked. And it was really me trying to make sure that I was using an implant that wouldn't get me into trouble in the first formative years of my practice, because the last thing you want when you start is to have complications because then the word gets out and there's a concern about your practice. So you wanna use a well, true and tried implant platform. You wanna use appropriate fixation and you wanna use appropriate instrument platforms that ensure they optimize the outcomes for your patient. The sort of things we were considering back then is appropriate component sizing. Preoperative templating was a standard for all patients back then. 
with those templates placed on analog x-rays, which were available at the time at about 115% or 120% magnification. The concern was if you undersized the tibia, you may end up with subsidence of the implant. If you oversized it, you'd end up with soft tissue impingement. So you've got to get that sizing correct. The femoral component, if you undersized it, you could end up notching the femur or you could end up with a loose flexion space and mid flexion instability. If you oversized it, you had a decreased range of motion due to overstuffing, particularly in the anterior compartment, and you could end up with soft tissue component impingement. Here's a case of windswept knees that went on to have appropriate total knee arthroplasties using the PFC. You'll see here at the beginning of my practice, certainly a component of my patients ended up with the PS, but overall my practice was predominantly 80 to 85% CR. In terms of fixation, the femoral component, you consider whether you use cement or cementless, same with the tibial component, and you may be an all cement, you may be all cementless, or you may be a hybrid, predominantly with the femoral component being cementless. I started out cementing all components. I quickly transitioned to hybrid fixation, and then the dual fixed tibial tray based on the AMK and later modified for the PFC came, was predominantly designed in Australia. It had a porous HA coating, was a very good surface preparation for cementless fixation, and I started using that. Now I have 20 years of experience with the dual fix tray. It's no longer on the market to share that with you. But this is one of the cases that was performed a long time ago. And now we have 20 year follow up. And one of the beauties of cementless fixation, if you have good surface preparation and there is differences between the tibial trays, is that interface between the bone and the implant remains pristine even two decades later. Standard conventional instrumentation. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, I used it for a long time. You will recognize all these instruments. Many of you are using these instruments. They still remain arguably the gold standard by which all measurements are made. Tibial alignment, the lower assembly, lies over the malleoli to find the midpoint of the ankle joint. You'll then distract that. So every six millimeters is one degree. You've got to decide depending on the mechanics of the implants that you're selecting, whether you're building in three degrees, five degrees, or seven degrees of posterior slope, or if you're using PS, certainly you're not gonna to add too much posterior slope, you'll go for zero, one, or two degrees. That will be a decision you make, but you have these conventional instrumentation that allows you to reproduce that in a reasonably reproducible fashion. Mediolateral translation, Basically, you align that along the tibial crest to ensure that the coronal plane of your tibial component is somewhat centered, particularly if you're aiming for the tibial component to be perpendicular to the long axis of the tibia. You then take your measurements off the tibial surface, eight millimeters from the high side, two millimeters from the low side, depending on whether you're in varus or valgus. You pin it, you make your cuts, you remove your tibial osteotomy, you size your tibia correctly and you finish the preparation of the tibia. On the femoral side, again, you're all familiar with this. The three foot film I used to do routinely for the first five years of my practice. I used to measure religiously the mechanical axis and the anatomical axis of the femur, whether it was four degrees, five degrees, six degrees or seven degrees. I'd then reproduce that with the femoral cutting from the intramedullary rod. Um, and then you'd basically reflect whatever the patient's femoral valgus angle is and make sure you make that cut so the femoral component is directly perpendicular. So you can get a gist that what we're aiming for in the first part of my practice was principally to ensure that I was doing a measured resection technique um, with the implants being perpendicular to the mechanical axis for every single case. Once you've made the distal femoral cut, you then made sure that you had a quadrilateral space used your extension spacer block to make sure the fit was correct. You'd reduce the patella and then you'd lift the leg really to see, have you achieved full extension? And if you have, you're fine. But this is the surgeon, this is the art of surgery. The surgeon would stand back and say, yep, that looks like full extension to me or maybe that's about five degrees. But was it really? We had no means of actually measuring it except when we looked at the x-rays in the post-operative film and saw the patient once we took all the drapes away. 
And of course, the bigger the patient, the more sizable the girth, then the harder it is to actually make that estimate and get it correct. But this is the technique we use. Some still use it today. Now, of course, we have more modern ways of determining what those angles are. And this is the ethos of this presentation leading up to the transition to robotics. The other thing we did religiously, I used to mark this out on every single patient. That is the trans axis, from the sulcus of the medial epicondyle to the most prominent point of the lateral epicondyle. Mark it out and ensure religiously that the femoral component is rotated to match this line in every single patient. You'd spend a little bit of time making sure you got the lines right or that your registrar got the lines right and reproduce it, arguing always that this is the correct way to arrange the femoral component so you ensure patellofemoral tracking is correct. Um, and also to make sure that in a valgus where you've got a hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle, you're not completely relying on the posterior condyle axis. So the measured resection and rotation to the trans epicondyle axis, rather unique. Why did we do this? Look, there were lots of presentations, and this is one of them, Scott and Thornhill, my mentors from Boston, Massachusetts. They were designers. They were certainly prolific publishers as well. And here we have a minimum 10 year follow-up using the PFC knee system, 92% overall survivorship, implant survivorship was 100%. And at the end of the day, if you're a young surgeon and you're in the early parts of your practice, you wanna select the technique, you wanna select an implant that delivers. And this certainly seemed to deliver. So there's no reason not to use it to follow that technique. So what changes over time? Well, things are introduced. Modern things come into being. Navigation systems came along in the noughties. They provided surgical information systems where the surgeon controls the intervention and performs the surgical action. That was the heralding cry. The problem was it was expensive. As with any new technology, there's a cost associated with it. Now, back then, this looked like quite a substantial cost because when compared to current robotics, it's a lot less, but at the time, this was a considerable cost. The other problem is it's usually a closed platform software. So it's implant specific, it's company specific. Nevertheless, they were available and computer assisted surgery came into being. It offered greater accuracy. And if we were after delivering an outcome to the patient that improved their well-being. You wanted to make sure that what you're aiming for is what you achieve for every patient, not just 90% of them or 95% of them. These were based on a number of different um, systems. One was CT based, others were fluoroscopy based, but the one I used was the image free, which means we didn't need any preoperative imaging, but you spent a lot of time mapping out the landmarks at the time of surgery. Three steps to navigation, there was data acquisition, it was tracking and there was registration. You required the hardware, which consisted of the camera, the computer, the arrays and trackers, and this instrument platform that went with that. This seemed like a good system at the time in delivering greater accuracy and was certainly well worth the trial. Some of you may well be familiar with the early um, versions of navigation as they presented that allowed you to look at the femoral flexion angle. You can see here the flexion space medially and laterally. For the first time, it gave you a digital readout of what we were actually seeing using conventional instrumentation. This was exciting at the time, and it seemed to deliver greater accuracy in our hands. It allows bone morphing with better landmarking, but for the first time, something was introduced into the operating theater that seemed to interfere with the way and the normal flow of what we would actually do. So you can see here the setup for me with a camera on one side opposite where I was standing. The assistant had to be out of the way. The computer screen was close. It was a touch screen. You were able to manipulate that during the surgery. The landmarking basically you had to establish for the computer where the tibial platter was medially and laterally, the anterior surface of the tibia, the medial lateral femoral condyles, the anterior surface of the femur. And from that, the computer would then go to work and create smart instruments so that every instrument that you normally had in terms of smart blocks, if you add an array to it, then it knew where it was in space. One of the difficulties, however, is that you had to manipulate that 
And it really came down to the dexterity of the surgeon to be able to manipulate those blocks into a position until the line went blue or green, depending on the system. And then you pinned it in place, hopefully within a degree or a millimeter of accuracy. It did slow the process down a little bit, but all with the intent of delivering good accuracy that made a substantial difference from conventional instrumentation. One way of measuring those outcomes was the CT Perth protocol, which we started to use routinely for every case. This allowed you using CT long films to actually measure the coronal position of the femoral tibial components, the sagittal position of the femoral tibial components, and importantly, the only way you can measure the rotational position of the femoral component. We started by doing a learning curve to see if the introduction of navigation or computer assisted surgery was going to slow us down substantially or lead to errors which we weren't anticipating. And we compared computer assisted knee arthroplasty to the jig. And we found, as you can see here, by measuring femoral rotation, flexion, tibial valgus. So basically, the coronal and sagittal position, as well as the rotation of each component, that with our learning curve of the first 20 patients, it didn't make a substantial difference. We certainly weren't finding errors. So this was worth pursuing further and doing a proper trial to see how much of a benefit this provided to our patients. The success in knee arthroplasty is to get correct implant alignment and to ensure good soft tissue balancing. The hope was by ensuring implant alignment was correct, soft tissue balancing would follow. TKA computer assisted surgery may therefore become the instrument by which we can ensure that we achieve this more often than not. And I put a big question mark on there because the question is, where are we going to end up from there? So we commenced a randomized study, randomized control navigation study, three surgeons, 150 patients. We randomized to SI navigation versus conventional instrumentation. We used the PFC fixed and mobile TKAs. CTs were performed routinely at six weeks and a clinical assessment by a physio at 12 weeks. This is to show you that no matter where, by randomizing, whether we use jigged or psi navigation, whether it was left or right knee, it was about the same for both, whether it was CRPS, there was really no difference, fixed or mobile, cemented or uncemented for tibia and femoral components, it was even across the park there for both components. So some of our results, what we found is the duration of surgery was certainly longer with the navigation. There was no question about that, and it was significant. But blood loss, similar for both, there was no difference in blood loss between the two, even though we didn't instrument the medullary canal. Post-op hemoglobin level was the same for both. Duration of stay was no different between either. So the only difference identified so far was it took longer to do the navigated total knee arthroplasty. We measured knee scores pre-op and post-op, as well as function scores pre-op and post-op, and again found little difference. Then we did the difference in score, that is from the post-op score, we took away the pre-op score. This is provides a more accurate representation of the changes resulting from surgery. And we found um, basically for the knee score, no significant difference between the two procedures. And with a function score, again, no significant difference between the two procedures. So in fact, we'd introduced technology, but at this point in time, we haven't actually identified a significant improvement in the patient's outcomes using PROM scores. We measured the CT data, and this started to show a little bit of difference in that you can see here, the femoral rotation, femoral component rotation, there was a significant difference between the two with the navigated being more accurate and the posterior tibial slope, that's the sagittal position of the tibial component, was more accurate with the navigated component. All the other components that we measured, there was no difference between the two. And this is to show you in a graphical representation, the femoral component rotation, although it looks across the board to be similar, it was found to be significantly different and improved with navigation. But for femoral flexion, which is a sagittal profile, there was no difference. Femoral coronal profile, there was no difference. Tibial coronal profile, there was no difference. The posterior slope, there was a difference, the sagittal profile of the tibial component. So our interim results showed no significant difference between either for the knee scores or the function score. There was a significant difference in duration of surgery between jigged and navigated with a jig system conventional taking 21 minutes less than the navigated technique. And there are correlations 
between the duration of surgery and the procedure, the JIG technique has shorter surgery time and older patients have shorter surgery time. And if there was some benefit to the navigator technique, it was that the femoral rotation was more accurate, the posterior tibial slope was more accurate. So we identified that there was a benefit there, but we were concerned about the fact that it took an extra 20 minutes or more to do navigation. And I must say over time, navigation for us kind of died out, particularly for what we call the fiddle factor. That is the fact that you could get those cutting blocks in a position, but it often took a little bit of time to ensure accuracy. And often you had to compromise and accept a millimeter off or a degree off from what you were actually aiming for. So in 2009, after looking for something that could potentially be less time consuming and more accurate, patient specific instrumentation in the form of the signature guides was introduced with a Vanguard total knee arthroplasty. And to me, I thought this was a really good concept. I liked the idea. No pins, no risk of fractures, no risk of pin site infection, no instrumenting of the medullary canals, no computer at all in the operative field. Go back to having your assistant stand wherever they want to stand. All planning was done preoperatively with none intraoperatively while the patient was under anesthesia. The implant size options were pre-selected. So you didn't need the full range from one to eight of every femoral component. You only needed the size that was pre-selected plus a size up or down potentially. Reduced instrumentation, improved setup times by about 17 minutes and this was measured and all planning is based on MRI for accuracy of landmarking. And here's an example of a patient that I would have with a varus deformity. We would do their preoperative MRI scans. We'd get the plans projected to us. We'd be able to manipulate the plans. We know the level of deformity they have beforehand. We'd select the implants. We'd look at the balance, both in flexion and extension, approve the plan. Eventually these patient specific instruments would be sent to us the whole period would take about four to five weeks. Then at the time of surgery, this is all the instruments that you need. It's a very simple um, set of two trays that you open and take, saves a lot of time in preparing for the patient. Scrub sisters are really happy with it. This is on a little bit of fast track, just to show you the tibial PSI that I was using for about 10 years would fit on very nicely. We'd have a drop rod, the visual line of sight confirmation. We'd pin this in sight. Once it's in, we'd use a standard cutting block, cut through that to remove the tibial biscuit. The femoral PSI would similarly sit straight onto the femur. This was quite accurate. It'd be pins in situ. Once the pins are placed in, the PSI guide is removed. And again, the standard cutting block is used to make the distal femoral cut. Again, the transepicondylar axis is drawn just for comparison, but you've already made that decision using the PSI guides and the MRI scan preoperative planning. The four in one cutting block is placed on. This is cut. This is again an approach for measured resection technique. And then you make the soft tissue releases as required after the reduction of the trial components. This was a satisfactory technique for implant alignment with overall good outcomes. This is a cementless vanguard that I used for a decade. A good cement bone interface was seen in all these patients, and there were no exclusions to these patients. This was in all comers. We reported on our first experience of 261 patients with the signature patient-specific guides, the alignment of the implants within three degrees, and the coronal, for it, uh, sorry, the coronal plane for the femoral component was 99%. Our coronal tibial component was 92%. Rotation of the femoral component was very high, accuracy of 96%. And the mechanical axis, we were hoping would be in excess of 90%, which is what we expected with navigation, to be computer assisted navigation. But here with the patient specific guides, it was more in the vicinity of 80%. They then went to new online planning software. It looked different. It felt a little bit different. It got, had some new nuances, but gave us a little bit more flexibility in preoperative planning. Uh, we continued to use this. And then we looked at our 700 knee replacements using this, reported on the first 500 that had good outcomes, 305 females, 195 males. There's the age groups. You can see they were in all comers up to the age of 90. 
all my patients total knee surgery between 2009 to 2015, all using cementless TKA. Again, CT Perth protocol was performed on all these patients who assessed the implant positioning, as we strongly believed that getting the implant position right would dictate a better outcome. You can see here the femoral component in terms of coronal positioning was 94%. There were outliers both in varus and valgus, but very small outliers here. The femoral component to the transepicondyl axis, this is rotation, 90%, with some outliers both in external rotation, excessive or internal rotation. The tibial component, again, 90%, with some outliers in varus and valgus. And overall mechanical axis was 82.4% in this large group, with some outliers, most of our outliers in this circumstance were in valgus, if they're going to be outliers, not in varus, interestingly. The thing, of course, is we focus so much on numbers that you can see a patient like this who comes for their post-operative visit, you take a look at them, you think, wow, this looks good, they walk, they have no pain, they have good range of motion, good flexion, but then you measure their numbers, they're in four degrees of valgus. So this would actually present as an outlier and question your technique, even though the patient was very happy. So sometimes you can get so focused on following patients up, you can actually sometimes do yourself a disservice, but it's all in actually collecting data and having an idea of how you're implanting these implants in these patients. So how critical is it really for these outliers as they appear to be happy and functioning well? can we detect a difference on outcome measures? Now, you would be aware of one of the landmark papers by Sebastian Perrat, Truesdale, and Dan Berry. And this reviewed 398 total knee replacements retrospectively um, for a 15-year Kaplan-Meier survivorship um, from the Mayo Clinic. 73% of total knee replacements were mechanically aligned within that elusive zero plus or minus three degrees only in the frontal plane were these x-rays taken. 27% were considered outliers, but again, I emphasize it was only the frontal plane or coronal plane that was measured. Of this group, total revisions, 15% in the aligned group. This is a group that was thought to be in excellent position, should have a better outcome, whereas in the outlier group that should have had the worst outcome, their revision rate was only 13%. Aseptic loosening with mechanical failure or wear was 5.8% in the aligned group, only 3.8% in the revised. So the questions were raised, if we're aiming to get all these patients perfectly aligned, we expect better outcomes. But this paper threw into perspective that maybe we're not actually looking at the correct means of assessing a successful knee replacement. So with a colleague of mine, um, Yes, I decided we'd review our own series and see if we could actually predict a better outcome for patients. We didn't have the long follow-up, but we looked at 444 patients with PSI TKA. At six years, they had a revision rate of 1.9% in all comers. So that was small. But our series divided them. They're all cementless TKAs. And we took a look at their range of motion. There's their preoperative deformity was from 21 degrees of varus up to 17 degrees of valgus. So they had all comers in this group. We also had all comers in terms of BMI. There was no exclusions here. We just wanted to see if we got our patients within the desired mechanical alignment, do we have a better outcome for these patients? Does neutral mechanical alignment plus or minus three degrees affect post-operative outcome? We found no difference in the post-operative scores whether you're an outlier or whether you're well aligned for the WOMAC, AKS, knee score, function score, or range of motion. Does more accurate alignment, that is if we measured, and we did, for those that were within the range of plus or minus one degree, does it affect post-operative outcome? And again, we found no difference. Does post-operative alignment affect post-operative outcome? If your post-operative deformity is within three degrees, no difference. So achieving good outcomes after knee is more than simply restoring neutral mechanical alignment or achieving perfect component orientation. So can we do better? Need more intraoperative information on prosthesis positioning? Need intraoperative feedback on the soft tissue envelope and flexion extension balance? And the question was, how can we achieve more information during the surgery that's more accurate, more validated, 
more feedback for the surgeon to be able to manipulate at the time of surgery, the patient's outcome. Is robotics the answer? It became available. The question was, should I consider it? And I really didn't hesitate because I thought we need to go one more step. So let me introduce robotics and the options. They can be fully active robots, semi-active, with or without haptics, and that's where most of the robots you will be exposed to actually are. And then there's passive robots. And most of the robots on the market, obviously I use the Rosa, but let me introduce you to Omnibot. So this is the Omnibiotics. So this is the Balance Bot and the Omnibot robot here. These are smaller robots, don't take the same real estate or footprint like the Rosa or the Mako. Mako is obviously the first robot on the market. It's been around now for about seven years. Rosa has been around for about two and a half years. Omnibot's been around for about three years. The Navio you're familiar with now, it's called the Cori. That's the new Smith and Nephew robot that's coming out. And there's a couple more on the market besides these. The benefits are they give you direct feedback with the cuts and implant position. They give you direct feedback about limb alignment, direct feedback about range of motion, which is actually measured in a digital format that you can read off and not guess. And there's a digital expression of the soft tissue envelope and the balance of the soft tissues that can vary from robot to robot. But the best thing about all of these is that it'll give you the estimate of what is required to achieve balance. And then once you've made the cut, it will validate that cut for you. So you know there and then if that cut is accurate or whether you've made an error and gives you the opportunity to go back and correct that if you choose to. You may not choose to, you may accept it, but at least you as a surgeon have the choice of going back and correcting that by a degree or two or a millimeter or two, whatever it takes to end up with the result that you actually set out to achieve in the first place. And for the first time, you have a means of actually detecting that and correcting it. So the benefits are you set the preoperative alignment targets, visually restore and validate the time of surgery. You adjust the soft tissue balance with the flexion gap balancing tool, which I've started using on a regular basis to titrate the soft tissue releases only as needed. This has changed my whole approach to total knee arthroplasty and it's actually improved my early outcomes for my patients. To look at the two, the robot, that I use uses standardized plain x-rays and you can go imageless if desired, but at least if the imaging is required, it's plain x-rays that are done following a protocol as opposed to the PSI, which required MRI or CT. Some of the robots also need CT routinely, but the one I use uses plain x-rays. There are no guides to manufacture, so the turnaround time is within a week, everything is ready to go. There's no delays in booking patients and the surgical approval can be done either preoperatively or at the time of surgery itself, whereas the PSI guides all need to be done with an approval approximately four weeks before, unless you have your own 3D printer and you're printing it at home. The approach no longer requires any medial or lateral releases on initial exposure. All I do on the exposure is simply a straightforward medial parapetolar approach, really to expose the knee. I don't do any medial releases. I don't go around the post-remedial corner even in a severe valgus, I don't do any significant lateral releases at all at the beginning. I do it after the cuts are made and the robot is used to help balance. And it's only then you may titrate some minor releases if required, but to be honest, we found that releasing has become really a minimal thing that we do not do as opposed to my routine technique with conventional instruments. I no longer translate the tibia anteriorly on the femur as part of the first exposure, which I used to do. The tibia, first is, tibia is cut first, then the distal femur. The flexion balance is now optimized with this balance tool called the fusion device, where I religiously drew the trans epichondral axis before. Now I actually landmark the epichondral axis, but no longer draw it, no longer look at it, because I use a balance tool to completely dictate femoral rotation to optimize flexion balance without having to do releases. I'm going to share with you the first steps here for robotics is to obviously put in the femoral array. The femoral array has to be pointing towards the camera. You can see here, the robot is standing on my left-hand side. I always place the robot on the right-hand side of the patient. Doesn't matter whether I'm doing a right knee or a left knee, I'll stand on the same side as the patient's knee that is being operated on, but the robot with a robotic arm will always stay 
on the right hand side. The arrays are put in the femur, secured into position. Then the tibial array is placed on the tibia. Of course, all arrays have to be adjusted so that they are pointing towards the camera, which is on the opposite side to the robotic arm. This means that between the arrays and the camera, you've got to be careful where your assistant is. So it does again dictate the positioning of your assistant and how they come in to help you because you've got to keep that line of sight nice and clear. Putting in the arrays really takes a couple of minutes. This is in real time as you see it go in. You basically use a three millimeter pin. I put all pins and arrays within the incision, uh, not outside the incision. So it's in metaphyseal bone, decreasing the risk of pin site fractures or pin site complications. Once you've put in the arrays, we start the registration process. You can see here the robotic arm will move through approximately six positions, thereby establishing its position on the floor in relationship to the patient. Once it does its six position movements, um, it is then locked and ready to go. And the array, which you can see here on the robotic arm is then exchanged for a cutting block that then is brought into position to help you cut the distal femur and the proximal tibia. This process takes about 90 seconds in order to register. Now the arm is registered. We go through a process of landmarking for the center of the femoral head, canal entry points, the posterior condyles, white sides line, transepicondylar axis, the posterior condylar line, and the anterior cortex to ensure no notching. We also mark out the malleoli, so we know the mechanical axis of the limb, and then positioning for the tibia. You'll see here how we go through that process. My assistant here is changing the array for the cutting block. I'm going through the 14 points that are collected for the center of the femoral head. So it's the top of mechanical alignment. Again, it's a quick process. It makes a noise every time that you stop in one position, collects that data. Once you've gone through that process, We then invert the patella, we take it up into flexion, and we start landmarking with the pointer for the entry hole for the intramedullary canal. We then use a universal guide that sits under the posterior condyles that measures the posterior condylar axis and introduces that into the robotic algorithm. We then use the pointer again, taking the base of the highest point of the notch and the lowest point for white sides line. We then feel for the medial epicondyle and go to the sulcus of the epicondyle. We feel for the map out the distal part of the femoral condyle with three points. We go to the lateral epicondyle. So now the trans epicondylar axis is registered. We go for the most distal part of the lateral femoral condyle to map that out. Once that's completed, we go to the anterior cortex. We put three points of registration here to ensure no notching. And this is important to gauge also the sizing of the femoral component anterior to posterior. Once that's collected, the femoral landmarking is complete. We then mark out the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus, which then defines the mechanical axis of that limb. We then mark out landmarking the anterior aspect of the tibia over the tuberosity for rotation of the tibial component, the medullary axis of the tibia, the PCL line, and then we mark out the lowest point, which is basically where you would put your stylus for the medial tibial plateau and the lateral tibial plateau. This whole process, as you can see, took about four minutes to four and a half minutes. That's the registration process. It doesn't take that much. It adds a little bit of time, but it probably saves you time in the long run. Once you've manipulated the robotic software, you're then ready to make your first cut. The robot, as you can see then, there's no, one of the downsides of navigation is trying to move that block and get it into the right position. Here, that work is done for you automatically. And then with collaborative mode, you move the tibial cutting block onto the tibia, you place the pins. You can use one, two, or three. I, as a rule, use three pins um, and that locks it onto the tibia. And then once that's in place, you're ready to make your cut. Using a standard saw, you make your tibial osteotomy and remove the tibial component. We're then ready to do the femoral side. 
And I do the tibia first, but you can do either first, but I find as a routine, tibia first works for me. Again, the robot goes through two movements on its own and then collaborative movement down to bone for safety. You adjust it in the right position. It will remain in the same plane no matter where the leg is. Pin it to the leg so it doesn't make any movements. Of course, what I'm not showing you here, but I will later is you're validating everything to make sure that the position is exactly what you predicted. Once that's in place, you then go through and cut your distal femur. Note that you do have to change the way you actually cut simply because of the presence of the robot and your assistance on the other side. Once you've done that, you can see you're validating the predicted cuts, the cuts you've actually achieved. Make sure they're close. It doesn't have to be perfect, but within half a millimeter or half a degree, you've planned three degrees of flexion, you've achieved three degrees of flexion. So it actually validates what you've done there and then. If you'd planned for 10 and only cut eight, you then got the choice of going back, cutting another two for whatever reason, it wasn't an accurate enough cut. This is the valid, the, sorry, this is a fusion device. So this is what is placed in extension and then brought to 90 degrees of flexion. It's then dialed up with a screwdriver to tension both the medial and lateral sides. And this will dictate the rotation of your femoral component. Once it's in the right position, the algorithm is then fed into the computer. And you have at that time the ability to move the tibial and femoral components into a position that at the end achieves a better balance for your knee. Now, we don't have the time here to show you everything. Um, however, you can see here, this is not balanced. The medial side flexion space is 18.5, whereas on the lateral side, it's 23. The extension space is 20, and on the lateral side, it's 21. But through a process being able to manipulate that, you can end up and you can manipulate the femoral component, the tibial component. You can end up with a balance that may equate something a little bit close to what you expected so that you have a flexion space that is 19 to 20 millimeters on both sides and an extension space that's 19 to 20 millimeters on both sides. Why 19? Because that's the minimum requirement to get your implants in. So you have that facility to change that once you've determined the rotational position, this is the final time that the robot comes into position. Again, with a collaborative mode onto the cut distal surface, you then put your two pins in, and this is the pins that will define where the four and one block goes. And it goes into that position, already dictating the rotation of the final seating of your femoral component. Once you've cut the four, uh, the four using the four and one block, you're then ready to do a trial. Once you do the trial, again, you check with your computer that the balance is correct. Do you need to do any soft tissue releases? More often than not, you don't. However, in very severe varus or valgus greater than 20 degrees, you may need to do. And at that point, after removing the posterior osteophytes, you would then come in and do whatever releases are required, but it will be a lot less than what you used to do prior to this because of the optimized positioning of your implants. You're then ready to put your implants in. I happen to be using the cementless persona um, tibial component here and the cementless persona femoral component. These are punched into position. You can see how a good hold it is initially. It's tapped home. Polyethylene component is then placed on that. A little trigger device pushes it home and secures its fixation to the tibial base plate. I use a CR in approximately 80 to 85 percent of my patients. A remainer will get a medial constrained knee. I don't use a PS anymore, or and I never cut a PS box anymore. Again, the cementless femoral component is then taken home, getting a secure fit in these patients. And then once in, you can do a final reduction and again, check on the computer that you've achieved the desired outcome in terms of extension, range deflection and balance. So the use of the arrays are some concerns for the femur and the tibia, but in over 170 cases, I've not had any fractures or other complications to date. 
Hopefully I won't, but there I will describe problems with pin site problems as you'd well be aware. And the worst complication would be ephemeral fracture after a navigated case. The cost is another issue. Cost can vary anything from $500 for the smaller robots per case up to a million dollars for a big robot as a one-off payment. These are ongoing costs for the patient as well um, in terms of use, but cost factor has to be taken into consideration. Back to the case example that I gave at the beginning, this patient had a very valgus knee. You can see here, the question was when? Well, obviously I waited a whole year after his hip replacement to make sure he didn't have a septic process, that everything settled, that he had a good outcome. There was no recovery to his foot drop. It remained a problem for him. Um, I proceeded with a knee replacement using robotic technique. You can see his preoperative assessment here showed that he had a 28 degree fixed valgus deformity. We ended up using Rosa. And this is his day one post-op sitting up in bed. This is more flexion than he's had for over two years now. Um, he's got a VAC device Provena dressing on and he's got his total knee replacement in place. Um, we did a small fenestrator release of the posterolateral corner as part of his correction, but he achieved good correction. And you can see the balance through the range of motion here from zero degrees of full extension to 90 degrees to beyond where his balance remains almost neutral throughout for someone who had a fixed 28 degree valgus deformity. So patients are more comfortable in the first 48 hours. They achieve flexion to 90 degrees in the first 24 hours. Improved sagittal alignment to the femoral and tibial components was noted. I compared the last 67 persona cementless TKAs that I performed using PSI technique to the very first 80 persona cementless TKAs using Rosa robot assisted technique, which was my learning curve all had the CT Perth protocol at six weeks. What I wanna share with you here is of interest, the femoral component using Rosa in the sagittal profile, that is femoral component flexion and tibial slope was much more accurate using the Rosa, Rosa robot compared to my PSI technique. So that was pleasing to see. And you can see how it's much tighter here in the green line for the robotic technique as compared to the PSI technique. As far as the other parameters, they were all similar. Femoral coronal alignment was 94% to 96%. Tibial coronal was similar and mechanical access was greater than PSI. So in conclusion, transitioning from PSI to robotic assist TKA has been a reasonably straightforward adjustment with a very small learning curve, allows significant changes in technique to be made with confidence to the benefit of patients and improved outcomes in the form of earlier mobility and knee flexion and improve sagittal alignment of the components. This has been my transition over the last 25 years. What does the future hold, particularly over the next 10 years? Well, each of those robotic techniques collects a mountain of data, which is provided to you on a USB stick or by email after, but it's also kept by the company. This is metadata that will be collated over a number of years for numerous patients globally from various to significant valgus deformities. And I suspect somewhere in the next 10 years, the robotic arm will become automated to provide solutions to soft tissue balancing for each type of scenario that's typed in preoperatively for each patient, thereby making us maybe just technicians in the journey. Who knows? But it's an exciting time to be part of. And I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rami. That was excellent. That was just wonderful. You know, your whole journey of uh, 25 years plus of knee replacement was amazing. And for the first time, I didn't bat I lied. I, I lied. I was listening through. I didn't sleep. I promise you. So, so uh, it is one hour. You've been speaking less about 55 minutes, but all of it was so enthralling. So you covered right from your PFC days to cementless to navigation to PSI to new online planning software to robotic. And I think at this point of time, Rami, you are convinced that robotic is the way to go. I could sense that I could read in between your lines, but but I have a few questions and then uh, Bharat and also we have sure. Vijay who has joined us can ask one or two questions and then we go to Bharat's talk. But uh, uh, firstly, excellent presentation. So my question to you is that uh, 
we have seen in the past, you know, excellent results with the conventional techniques with, you know, long-term studies showing us 20-year plus survivorship. So, of course, it's too early to say about the improvement in survivorship. But then when we were having good results, we were having a good survivorship. What do you think is it that this robotic system is going to add? Is it going to add the years? Is it going to make it 25 or 30 years? Or what difference is it going to make to the conventional technique? So, Parag, you, Bharat, Vijay, myself, we all get successful results, right? We all do good knee surgery, but we don't do it 100% of the time. I'm sure if you look close enough, I know I will say I get the odd patient every now and then where I look at the x-ray and think, yeah, gee, I wish I got that a little bit better or I wish I did something a little bit different for this guy. Why, why isn't this guy as happy as he should be? When we talk about survivorship, what are we talking about? We're talking about the fact that the knee implant hasn't been revised by somebody else in the last 15 years. But does that mm -hmm. mean the patient has a good result? It's not the same. PROMS, which is now being collected on a routine basis in our joint registry, will give us a different story to routine registry survivorship. So a patient can be in pain, have a stiff knee, but they can still register as a successful outcome in terms of survivorship studies and in terms of registry data. But when you do a knee replacement, on the whole, as I said at the beginning, conventional instrumentations remain the gold standard by which everything is measured. But you and I will come to realize, and I've already realized, that robotic techniques gives me more information at the more critical time of the procedure, that is during the operation, that if I'm not using the robot now, and if I'm in the public hospital, I don't use the robot at present. I got to tell you, I have access to it, but I don't use it because I'm still teaching the foundation to my registrars. And I want to do that with conventional instruments, right? Mm -hmm. and I don't think someone should do the transition without really getting a good hold of foundation arthroplasty basics using conventional instrumentation. Right. But when I use conventional instruments now, I'll do the cut and I go to validate and I think, ooh, I can't actually validate the cut. I can't actually see how accurate it is now. I have to wait for the post-operative x-ray. And then I'll do my first trial reduction with the trial components. I look up as if there's a screen there and think, I can't actually, I have to go back and rely on what I've done for two decades. And that is have a feel of the knee. Yeah, that feels good. That feels tight enough through flexion. Well, why do I have to guess anymore? I don't want to guess. I actually want to be able to tell exactly where I am and what I've achieved and whether I have the need to correct it a little bit more at that point in time, rather than hoping I had, you know, six hours later when I see the patient first get up or the post-operative x-ray. I think that's the best answer. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, any quick comments from uh, Bharat and Vijay or any questions you may have? Bharat first. I have yes. a question uh, and a comment, both. Hi, Rami. Uh, as usual, I mean, we will have one other one hour session moderated by Parag for a more exhaustive uh, exchange of uh, views on this matter. But I'll try to very quickly ask you a little thing here. Robotics is just one more layer added to CAS. You, the underlying planning and validation is all CAS, nothing new. Robotics is just in your, in the Rosa's case, I saw that it is the blocks that are being positioned by the robot. And say in Navio case, you have the cutting instrument being controlled by the robot. So there are these two different approaches, basically trying to convince us that cutting the bone hair would become a bit more accurate with robot because a mechanical arm, which has hopefully no play uh, in it, is now giving you the chance to uh, assist you in your cuts. However, the planning and the validation is still the same old CAS. And I use the word old with a bit of uh, you know, meaning behind this. You yourself in your lecture said that with CAS, you did not find as much uh, you know, benefit as you would have hoped for. In other words, 
if CAS has not, and we now know that CAS has not added any real value in terms of long-term uh, clinical outcomes, the 20% deficit is still there, despite CAS having been in around for more than 10 years now. We are now hoping that the 20% deficit will be compensated or will be eliminated or mitigated or reduced by the use of introduction of robots. And again, the entire thing is that the robot will allow you to actually measure and control even those one mm and two mm cuts, which so many times are dependent upon whether your blade is you know, sharp enough or whether the, the surgeon is using a thin or a thick blade, the kerf, as we say. You know, one or two millimeter, Rami, is something that we as experienced surgeons know depend on a lot more than one particular technology. You know, uh, and, and my submission to you is that how much cost can the health economics, which is also an important part of zooming out as the senior responsible surgeons, how much cost can we add on to the system in the hopes of trying to pursue an objective which is less and less gain and more and more incremental, not pain, but uh, a resource that we en end up deploying. So I'm not against new technology. I'm just trying to put out my message. Do we titrate appropriate value titration when we talk about these technologies? You know, That's my, my, my point. So I'm gonna answer that Bharat by asking you one question. That is, do you measure the alignment in all planes of each component of each patient that you do? Because I think until we do that, we don't actually appreciate how often we're a little bit off. I'm not talking just one or two millimeters. I'm talking in some cases, five degrees, right? Yep. So if you aimed to align the tibial component or the femoral component in a certain way, but you're five degrees out, if you had the opportunity to correct that, do you think that would be worthwhile correcting? Yes. I'm going to answer for you. I'm going to have to say yes, because I know you. You would say yes. Yes. Well, this is what this delivers. This delivers the ability. Now, you're not going to do that very often, but maybe even if it's once a year. If you have one patient who really has a problem and you end up having to revise them and then they get an infection and then there's an array of complications and they end up stiff, you haven't done that patient a service. And if you've got a means of reproducing the level of accuracy on a more consistent basis using a bit of technology, which in 10 years' time will be another conventional instrument in the OR, probably at a similar cost, then you would use it, all right? That, that's my only argument, that, you know, I used NAV. I demonstrated that Okay, it did improve accuracy in the sagittal plane, as we demonstrated in that randomized study, but it also took us an extra 20 minutes or longer to use it at the time. So, and then the fiddle factor of not having the consistency of having to line it up with the line of sight, that's what was a detractor at the time and made me transition to something different. But now I've got a reproducible arm that brings the block into the exact position. All I have to do, I don't even have to look at the screen. I just put it on the patient and I know it's in the right position. I make the cut. So it's just those extra steps, which means I'm not actually spending an extra 20 minutes. We've actually, you saw the live surgery, an hour to do a knee replacement. Yes, it was a routine knee replacement. It wasn't a complex. So, but then for my routine, it takes me an hour. This hasn't added any extra time. So if I can improve my accuracy, even if it's just in a few patients, um, without increasing the time factor or the fiddle factor, I think that's a benefit. But your point about cost is valid. And there are robots that don't cost as much, which are entry level. And then there's those that are more expensive. You've got to identify what suits the community and the practice that you do. But Absolutely. the conventional instruments still remain the gold standard by which to measure against for anything that's being introduced. And I agree with that. Absolutely. So thank you so much for that answer. And uh, Vijay, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, uh, and yes, then we I, uh, Rami, uh, uh, good to see you a long time. Uh, Rami, my question to you is, uh, do you aim for mechanical alignment with the ROSA all the time? Or would you, what we now call as adjusted uh, mechanical alignment? The reason I'm asking this is, uh, we use the Navio, 
and you find the real value of the robot comes in when you want to change a little bit from uh, mechanical alignment and uh, build in a, a bit of uh, kinematic, not, not go all the way kinematic, but build in a sort of a, to, to, in my mind, the future lies in a combination of uh, mechanical and kinematic. That's where the future lies, in my opinion. So my question to you is, do you aim uh, mechanical all the time or you would... Uh, so, you know, I just so BJ, this is exactly the crux of the matter that you have just outlined. That is, while you use conventional instruments, you should stick to mechanical alignment for now. And that's what I did for over two decades. One, because I didn't know whether the cut was accurate enough to base gap balancing off for that matter. Did I get the tibial base right on which to base femoral rotation? But now, using the robot, I've been using it for over a year and a half. Initially, I started with mechanical alignment for everyone. Within a few months, I found I was getting so much information during the procedure, I was happy to vary things a little. And if you are one of those surgeons that wants to vary, so now, I, as I said, I don't look at the transepicondral axis anymore. I mark it, but now I completely disregard it. I use the flexion gap balance tool, and that dictates the femoral rotation into the position that best allows a better gap balance in flexion at 90 degrees and through the range of flexion. But I only do that because I have that intraoperative validation of the cuts that I've made to let me know that each point is accurate. Because if you have a mistake initially, you can compound that mistake if you're basing the next step on the one where you've made an error. So using robotics will allow you the freedom to even rotate your femoral component a little bit, maybe put it in a degree or two of varus or valgus whereas I'd never think of doing that with conventional instrumentations. I would cut and I'd release to balance. But here you can accommodate that for your individualized alignment or adjusted kinematic alignment or kinema full kinematics with restrictions. You choose, but it allows you that flexibility. And I think that's where the future is. I agree with you. Even for all of us that are hard rusted on, you know, um, mechanical aligners, we will change with time, and I have changed already because I have that information at my disposal, which I didn't have before. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, thanks, Vijay, for those questions. And thanks, Bharat. So I think excellent, Rami. Uh, fantastic talk. You know, through your journey, you Pleasure. told us uh, the importance of robotics, and uh, you really made a very nice, uh, genuine, a true presentation, and you took us through your entire journey, which was a learning experience for uh, all of us. So thank you for that. And a special thanks because I know it's about 11 uh, in the night in Sydney and <laughs> you, you're still with us so fresh. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you for accepting our invitation. But at any moment you want to leave, uh, uh, you're free to go. But the next talk is going to be very, very interesting in case you decide to build a private hospital in Sydney, then I would urge you, you please stay on. If I build a private hospital, <laughs> I will engage a certain Professor Modi to come and build it for me, right? <laughs> yeah, so 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 uh, nothing is impossible. So with that, Rami, thank, uh, you. thank you so much and congratulations to your country for uh, winning uh, you know, 46 medals and the closing ceremony is going on, but yet you are here with us. We appreciate right. that your country had 17 golds. That's very fascinating. Seven silvers and 22 bronze. a good couple of weeks. So Thanks, that's good. Thanks okay. very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, Bye for now. Bye. So with this, we come to the end of uh, the, the robotics talk from uh, Professor Rami Soriel, and it was a very enlightening talk. With that, we, we shift gears, and now it's my proud privilege to uh, introduce to you uh, none other than uh, Professor Bharat Modi. Everybody knows him. He's a very famous arthroplasty surgeon uh, uh, from uh, Gujarat, Baroda. And he has done more than 20,000 hips and knees till date. But that's not the reason why he's here. He's, of course, very famous. He's been a past president of the Indian Arthroplasty Association. He's an incoming president of the Asia-Pacific Arthroplasty uh, Association. The reason why he's here is because he has a very deep and a keen interest in hospital planning. I must tell you one story here that there was one uh, marathon I was attending of the FSAI. Now you might ask what FSAI is. It's the Fire uh, uh, and Security Association of India. And I met one gentleman there and he asked me, do you know Dr. Bharat Modi? 
oh my god i said how is this gentleman a fire guy asking about bharat modi and then he said oh my that guy is incredible he knows so much and we call him for our seminars and webinars and that's where i knew that this gentleman has you know so many uh, uh, so many feathers in his cap apart from being an arthroplasty surgeon that's not the only cap he wears when he came to pune i remember the kind of discussions he had with uh, my father who also takes keen interest in architecture and then i uh, and then i went and tested the pudding itself i went and saw his hospital incredible planning super planning to the t you know everything was so well thought of and that is the reason why we have bharat modi with us today he is not going to give an arthroplasty talk and since we are celebrating the bone and joint decade uh, we have taken the liberty to move a little bit away from uh, the academics because i think this is also important because as entrepreneurs everybody wants to make an hospital our uh, own professor has a, a very nice setup in sangli professor ajit shinde has a, a private hospital and i'm sure he is also very eager to hear this talk so without any further ado uh, professor bharat welcome and we are very very eager to hear from you the 10 labors of hercules on how to build a hospital it's all yours thank you parai thank you so much it's an incredible pleasure and privilege to once again participate with maharashtra orthopedic association uh, academic programs parag is of course someone who is indefatigable and uh, it, it, he amazes me i mean although he's an incredibly close friend over the years but you amaze me with your energy to take on these responsibilities uh, i say hello to dr shiva shankar dr ajit shinde my friend vijay and in case ram is still around well as you know in india unlike say in the west we doctors are still uh, as of now at least uh, engaged uh, in the in the act of trying to build our own healthcare infrastructure uh, it is actually not only just uh, aspirational in nature but in many parts of our country it is still a requirement because not all uh, all urban areas yet have the ability wherein surgeons can find an appropriate healthcare infrastructure and therefore they might wish to do so themselves so gentlemen what i propose to do is i'll start with sharing my screen oh yeah here we go so what i propose to do is uh to take you through the process in case any of you is actually looking at building a hospital of his or her own i would like you to organize your thoughts maybe give you what i have learned in the process of building welcare hospital and the first thing that i can come up with in trying to if i have to give a one uh, half a line message then the message would be this that to come up with an appropriate healthcare facility is the equivalent of the greek mythological labors of hercules in terms of the challenges that it uh, gives you or in our own mythology abhimanyu's chakras you know how many chakras he had to break through uh, uh, as a challenge and that is almost the same and you will see what i mean as i go along in this talk so first of all what is a good building at the end of the day a hospital is a building to begin with and what is a good building vitruvius who was a very famous roman uh, army military architect and he laid down some phenomenal principles of architecture and the principles of architecture and this is from him that a good building should satisfy the three principles of firmitas utilitas and venustas firmitas means durability it should stand up robustly and remain in good condition and in uh, uh, relation to this particular thing we are talking about a minimum of 50 years and more because hospitals are public utility buildings and public utility buildings are or should be designed to last at least 50 years utility it should be useful and the functional aspect should be so well suited that it should make it a pleasure for the people who are using it and lastly venustas as in the legendary beauty of venus it should be a delight to for people to see and uh, enter that building so how does the process of uh, building a hospital start 
I realized in my own journey that you can divide it into these six phases. And every phase is something that is very important. And let me start with the first phase, which is that of ideation and project analysis. This is the most important phase, uh, gentlemen. Ask yourself, why do I want to do it? Why do I want to take on the responsibility and the risk of putting up a large building, which is by definition a very costly affair? Am I trying to catch up, outdo or compete with a peer who has already done it? You know, in your own city, someone else seems to be doing well with his own hospital, it looks, and you know, it feels great to own a spanking new building of your own. Is that the reason? Or is there a business opportunity for you in running a hospital platform? Remember, in the times to come, owning large buildings is going to be even more of a responsibility with compliance coming from various government departments as an absolutely must, especially with these fires that you just recently saw, the Supreme Court intervening. The Supreme Court intervening for individual cases of uh, hospital building disasters. The second question you ask is, do I have the necessary strength in, in, in terms of diversified areas of interest? Do you have that energy? You might be a brilliant surgeon, but do you really have the energy to do what it is required to build and then run a hospital? Do you have the grit to face the pressures that come from various governmental departments? Do you have the financial ability? So all these questions you should ask yourself honestly before launching yourself on this mission. Once clear on the above, then collect information, discuss with various relevant persons, hire professional agencies as for example, chartered accountants, hospital consultant, etc., and create a detailed project report. Do a SWOT analysis. What is a SWOT analysis? It, it is a very standard thing that most, uh, I mean, almost all industry business uh, houses deploy or employ. Strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. These four aspects is no industrialist or a business house will put up a project without going through the SWOT analysis of that idea. So do a SWOT analysis, then firm up the finances for the project in terms of whether equity, debt, partnerships, et cetera. And then you move ahead to the next step. Remember, this phase will ask, will require you to interface with the following agencies. Every phase, I will make you understand the essence of what it means and which are the uh, phase, I mean, which are the agencies with whom you should interact at this phase. So as I was say, just saying in the previous slide, talk to your family members. Are they all with you? Do they understand the risks that you are taking, the stress that it is going to bring into the entire family? Talk to friends and well-wishers to get a genuine feedback about, you know, you, you, you can talk to fair weather friends and they will, depending upon how your relationship is, they might just uh, applaud you. Yes, go ahead, man. You also should deserve such a building like that other doctor, you know. So instead of that, talk to your true well-wishers who can then give you an honest opinion whether you are in the right frame to take on a project, large project. Talk to chartered accountants, hospital consultant agencies, banks, financiers and investors if you require finances from outside, and lawyers because all these guys are going to educate you to a point where you yourself will start understanding the bite that you are about to take. So the first phase, ideation and project analysis is probably the most important phase in terms of the risk understanding that you are going to take once you take on a project like this. Phase two, I restrict only this as phase two, land procurement. In our country, this is the most difficult hurdle uh, 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 rather than anything else. You can go back to phase one. You would have done your analysis. You've got your finances tied up. You've got all your appropriate investors, et cetera, in, aligned with you. However, if you don't have an appropriate land and getting a suitably sized land, which has title clearance, non-agricultural status, in a commercial zone with no other lit litigation or resplendence pending on it at an opportune location in India is just short of finding God himself. Let me assure you that it is that difficult. So agricultural status land, for example, is a minefield 
to get it cleared up to a non-agricultural status is about as complex as face or limb transplant surgery. So unless you have a very clear lot of land, uh, parcel of land, it will be very difficult to move ahead with this particular uh, project or dream that you might have. Which are the agencies you will have to interface with as far as this phase is concerned, land procurement, land agents or prospective sellers, revenue department, the collector office to get your clearances for NA in case you haven't already got it or the change of purpose of land from one purpose to the other, the municipal corporation or commissioner office to allow you to get the uh, building plans and building permission uh, approvals, the urban development authority to appropriate zoning of the land that you are in, the town planning department in case that land is all, not already covered in a town planning scheme. All these are issues which I presume in my experience, I have seen that most of our doctor colleagues are not even aware of. They think that just because they have seen buildings cropping up by real estate developers in their, in their city or town, they think that it is relatively easy if you have a land and money in hand and a dream in your uh, heart, you'll be able to come up with a building. Each one of these are those proverbial Abhimanyu's kothas, you know, the chakras that I just referred to earlier. And then you should get an architect who specializes in local building bylaws, not a, not a creative architect, but an architect who actually understands only the bylaws, the, what is known as the general development control regulations of your city or town, and is capable of getting the clearances from those uh, from the revenue department or municipal corporation, as I just mentioned earlier. And lastly, lawyers who will be specializing in creating a secure transaction deed uh, documentation. This last bit is also extremely important. If you try to save on this part and don't get a competent lawyer, you might find that very late in your game, you suddenly will have legal issues harassing you to the point where it can make you go bankrupt. Phase three, you have done all that. Now you've got your land in hand. Now, what is the next phase? Now you have the responsibility of identifying and hiring design consultants. Enact the designing part, which is very different from building the hospital. This is the most critical phase as far as now the construction of your hospital and a successful uh, execution of the project is concerned. Abraham Lincoln had made this very famous uh, you know, statement that if I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I would spend six of those hours sharpening my ax. What does he mean? The sharpening of the ax is exactly the same as coming up with an appropriate detailed designing of your hospital. And what does this mean? The more time you invest in doing an exhaustive and comprehensive task at the design phase of your project, the less time and resource will you waste during the execution. I, in my uh, time, ended up spending almost two to three years after procuring land and announcing to my colleagues and Vadodara is not a big city. So it was pretty mm, rapidly spread news that uh, Bharat Modi is coming up with a relatively large hospital project. And then nothing happened for two and a half to three years. And there was, um, uh, with good reason, uh, you know, whispers coming along that maybe he has chickened out or maybe uh, the land price is in, uh, has improved and therefore he's just going to sell the land off. But it, it wasn't the case. My, uh, I had learned from Abraham Lincoln's uh, phrase, I was sharpening my ax. Almost always the mistake that is made is to initiate the project as soon as the first set of drawings are made, thinking that the remaining designs will evolve and fall into place as the project advances. Nothing can be further from the truth. So please do not make haste in digging your, and this will typically happen because your investors or your bank, if you've taken a loan, will now start pressurizing you to show results of, about, the, about that money. But if you are able to handle them appropriately, you should spend enough time. And which are the agencies that you will have to interface with? The major agencies are like these the architect and please understand before i started getting into all this construction business i thought that the architect is the one one stop guy with whom we sort of are supposed to get all our inputs from actually nothing can be further from the truth 
uh, architect is only a, one of the consultants in, involved. You have your structural engineers, the HVAC. HVAC means heating, ventilation, and air conditioning consultant, electrical consultant, plumbing consultant, low voltage system consultant, which like CCTV, fire, public announcement, voice telephone, etc. Information technology consultant, uh, which includes the network and the hardware part of your, uh, you know, you can actually look at a hospital building as almost like a human body. You know, uh, for example, the HVAC is the lungs part of it. Uh, the plumbing is the water works of our body. The, uh, you know, if you have a obstruction uh, uh, uropathy, you know what happens to the bladder and the uh, overall body status. Similarly, information technology is like your neurology of your body. In, in other words, each and every aspect, you can almost as doctors intuitively correlate a, a, a good hospital building or for that matter, any public utility building is actually like a living body. And it has to have all those five senses properly integrated for it to be a good a productive uh, body, you know? And you, over and above that, you'll have these minor agencies like the nurse calls, the access control, the time attendance, the kitchen design, the medical gas, medical equipment, structural glass and glazing. In other words, you will have to familiarize yourself with all these different aspects of what a hospital building project means or any large building project uh, means. If you don't get some, uh, some degree of familiarity, the chances are either the work that is happening will be slipshod or you will end up paying more money than you can afford. And at the end of the day, your integrated aspects of all this will not be appropriately integrated and you will have a troubled diseased body with which you'll have to put up, you know, uh, expect work. Phase four, now you've done all that. You've got your, you've taken enough interest, you've spent the hours and hours and hours required with each one of these design consultants. You've brought in all the inputs as a doctor from you, your colleagues, everything. And now you've got some lovely hospital plans ready, building plans ready on paper. Now what you do, you start tendering, bidding, and finalization, which means you start engaging with the contractors who are a completely different set of people as compared to the designers. They are very different segment of uh, people with whom you will now have to engage. And this is in terms of commercial aspects. This is the most commercially challenging part of the process. Doing an efficient job here in terms of identifying truly accomplished contracting entities, negotiating a fair price, fair price, remember that. Both sides, it is very important to have a fair negotiation. You, uh, If you try to squeeze every little penny out of this negotiation, the chances are if you throw peanuts, you'll only get monkeys to handle your project and you will end up getting a higher cost later on. So negotiating a fair price for both sides is very important for cost containment and timeline for completion of the entire project. Wrong choice can lead to irritation at the very least and litigation and even suspension of work at the very worst. So tendering, bidding and finalization is a very, very important and you require some experience in it. So maybe you can reach out to your, uh, you know, build up friends, et cetera, to sit with you when you are uh, for the first time in your first hospital building anyway, you should have some other people helping you with this aspect of your uh, phase of, of the entire thing. And here, the agencies you'll have to interface with are people like the civil contractors who do the structure works and the masonry build walls, etc. The HVAC contractors who do the high side and the low side, which means the chillers, primary pumps, secondary pumps, etc. And the low sides, which means the AHUs, CSUs, FCUs, VRV systems, etc. Electrical contractor, once again, the high side, which means the transformer, the things which you normally see in the electrical yard, and the low side, which means the switches and the lights that you will have running through your entire building. The plumbing, which means the supply side and the drainage side. So each is this an incredibly evolved uh, you know, process. And as long as you understood this right at the beginning of your uh, yatra, you will find that you would do a much more methodical job. Don't just jump into the uh, sea thinking that by moving your 
arms and legs, you will, you will be able to negotiate your way to the other uh, side, you know. So low, similarly, it goes for low voltage system contractors, information technology, etc. Interior designer, hospital furniture, elevators. In fact, elevators is actually one of the most difficult thing. You might think that it is. it just means the two or four or five lifts, but actually the lead time. So many times people make the mistake of leaving the elevator negotiations, thinking that it's going to come a bit later, not realizing that for various reasons, which I will not take up the time just now, the lead time, the time it takes for the elevator aspects to be actually addressed with, with uh, agencies or with the vendor whom you will eventually select is in months, six months, eight months. So if you think that now the building seems to be getting ready, uh, finished, and now you'll we'll start talking with the lift guys, you will find that just because of the lift uh, not being put into place, your completed building otherwise will not be functional for another six months. So these are the sort of nuances which I would like to bring to your notice. Uh, and lastly, uh, nurse call system, probably the most underrated piece of equipment. You will get, you will get vendors who will be ready to offer you a system for just 50,000 and you will have vendors who will say that our system will cause, uh, cost you anywhere from 8 to 10 lakhs for the same uh, size of that system. And that itself should alert you that there is such a huge range of technology and features. And it is up to you to understand which of the system is best for you and how you will titrate the cost. Uh, but I'm, this lecture is only supposed to sensitize you the actual process of learning, you can break down each one of these into a separate uh, lecture on its own. You know, similarly, access control and time attendance. So the agencies which will have to interface, last thing is kitchen equipment, medical gas, each one of these. It, lastly, the garden and estate planning uh, agencies. In terms of medical equipment, of course, depending upon the, uh, the, the, the type of hospital, whether multi-specialty or single specialty, you will have once again a massive area of work uh, in front of you. Operation theaters for us, arthroplasty guys, is the most critical area along with ICU design. And uh, uh, I, I would suggest that you should uh, uh, go into very, very extensive understanding of what operation theaters can be, modern operation theaters, and how you can design a cost effective and yet a very, very high uh, secure uh, sort of an operation theater. Next phase, the second last phase will be the execution of the entire building process. This, this is the most arduous, frustrating and exhausting part of the process. Even if one presumes that all the previous steps have been done with great efficiency, this part will still leave an indelible sense of nightmare for the rest of one's life. And trust me, I'm, I've just started another 120,000 square feet building in my campus next to the existing one. And despite my extensive experience by now on this, I'm going through this execution part and it is still a challenge, you know. So coordinating between different agencies, monitoring the quality, keeping a check on the billing process, sticking to timelines is a Herculean task in itself. At one point, you will find that there will be 40 different agencies working simultaneously, all these different contractors working simultaneously, each with it with a mind of its own and apparently blind to each other's needs. So you will have to control this, not you personally, but you will have to put people in place who can understand how to control these agencies. Otherwise, it will be one large chaotic Mela, you know, you will need an extremely efficient project management team which is genuinely loyal to you. Otherwise, you might find a lot of uh, hemorrhage in the system, financial wise. Your billing, etc., could be overinflated, and uh, you can your project cost can go for a toss if you don't have an appropriate team, even at this late stage in the entire process. And lastly, commissioning of the building project. This phase includes a period of building your organogram. So now you are just about three months away from everything, uh, you know, ribbon cutting. You have to start planning three months in advance about your organogram, recruiting a core team for different departments, initial training of the HIMS that you have put in, of all the equipment, 
It includes getting the necessary permissions from different governmental, semi-governmental, and regulatory agencies like the fire department to start, you know, occupation certificate. All this electricity connection, clarity, water supply uh, connectivity. Each one of these is an important milestone without which you cannot actually start even after completing the entire uh, uh, process. And you might think by this time that uh, you have now, now that the easy part is over, and let me warn you, uh, friends, that if that once the easy part, oh, I think I've lost the uh, video on this, but I just wanted to make you understand that once you've finished your project, you thought you would have created Cinderella's buggy, but it is actually a bull coming out of a rodeo. And a large project has its own cost. It's a gas guzzling uh, building in terms of money. And your real challenge and stress levels and adrenaline as well as uh, cortisol, both will start pumping out once you have got your billing, I mean, re revenue fixed cost starting with a building like this size, you know. So now, having given you an understanding of what this entire process, process is, I'll quickly go through my own personal uh, journey in creating WellCare Hospital. The search for land uh, took me almost uh, two years. And as I said, getting an appropriate piece of land in itself is a, a massive task. And uh, is it rightly placed? Is it appropriately located? Are there adequate road accesses around it? Then I started the search for architects, which once again took me two years. I went to uh, Mumbai. Manviwala Kutub was a Mumbai-based architect. Uh, Hosmek was also Mumbai-based. I went to Kolkata. And then eventually this was a Delhi and Bangalore-based architect, which I selected. And there are many uh, architectural firms, uh, but make sure that you go to people who know how to build a large hospital, not nursing homes, but a professional designed large hospital building. There are now special architecture architects teams available. And if your project is anywhere beyond uh, 30,000 square feet of built up space, I would strongly suggest go for specialized people as, as far as this entire process is concerned. The, uh, for example, in my case, I did very, very fine uh, uh, titration. And I'm just giving you one example of what I did uh, in, in planning with my architect. And the sciography, what is sciography? Sciography is the study of shadows. There are softwares available, which if you use this software, you can put your proposed building at the appropriate proposed building site into this software. And it will analyze day by day, hour by hour, the entire incipient sunlight, which will come on a, a proposed building shape. And it will work out at the end of the number crunching it will this was my actual building that we did and we were able to work out exactly how much heat will ingress into my buildings how much light will ingress as you can see here the red line was the was the length uh, how in in feet how many would in how much heat would ingress and when it will start cooling off and yet there would be light in that area why what, psychrometric studies this is about winds how winds would impact my building and eventually in net joules, we could work out what is the what is the heat load on every wall and every area. Once we did all this, and then there are other things like horizontal planning. These are known as blocking diagrams. Vertical planning, if it's a multi-storied building, these are known as stacking diagrams. And then, of course, the overall workflow of the buildings. And all this process will come up with huge amount of information that will be generated through that one day one ideation to up to now. Learn to capture this information and, and, and do a appropriate cataloging. Otherwise, you will be lost later on. Be, spend that time required and that obsession required to catalog your entire data. As you can see, this is just one understanding of my master folder. Each of these folder is then have a subfolder and so on and so on. But I, I have absolutely everything cataloged uh, right up to the last thing and how does this help for example i did this psychrometric and uh, sciography studies and it eventually has translated into an, uh, my ability to run my hospital so efficiently and a good example of this is electricity consumption these are real figures that i'm offering you uh, of the year 2015 16 etc and these are actual bills that i am showing you uh, as proof of the pudding so that there is no 
uh, you know, cynicism about it. And my average cost of air conditioning, energizing my 100,000 square feet building is only rupees 3.22 per square foot per month, which obviously is an extremely good thing. Typically, the energy bill of large buildings itself, such an incredible fixed cost, uh, uh, you know, fixed cost uh, load, that most management people find it. Uh, but because I uh, went through all this understanding that my actually this glass that is being put, we, I sat down with Ashahi glass engineers to understand which out of the 14, 19 glasses that they had was the appropriate glass for my type of a building in the location, in the area in which the sun rays were coming, etc. These are during my, uh, and then this is as the building started completion, completing, and this is after the building was completed. And what you can see here are the final finished product, products of the labors uh, of uh, not Hercules, but Bharat Modi here. And uh, it's a joy. Uh, once you go through this entire process, these are our operation theater complex areas. And uh, uh, we, we, we have uh, all these different types of uh, technology put into place. And we'll now just quickly give you a glimpse of the uh, areas of uh, in our operation theaters. And as you can see, that is a clean core area. We are now seven years down the line. I can assure you these photographs are exactly the same, reflect the same state of the building it was six years back. And each small thing, uh, every theater has been pre-wired for international broadcasting in high definition, every theater. And this is all possible if you have planned it early on. The small things like what grade silicone you are using for your joints, and the laminar flow and validating that laminar flow with uh, not only laser particle counting, but also the penetration test, the titanium dioxide smoke test, the anemometer showing the velocity test. And then we have integrated a control panel, which gives us online every day we can, at the start of the day, we know uh, what are the functioning parameters of our uh, uh, system you know that is going on and i will end my lecture with this tiny uh, one minute video which shows So that brings me to the end of my talk, Parag, and uh, I hope people have found it useful in terms of trying to go through their own process and yatra of building a large building. Absolutely, Bharat. Uh, more than useful. A lot of insights. You know, in uh, about uh, 30 to 35 minutes, you really covered the entire gamut of, you know, how to plan a hospital. So it was fantastic. And uh, I wish to uh, thank you for this excellent talk. You know, we all know your uh, arthroplasty skills, but we are very happy to learn about your uh, planning skills also. And I remember the talk also you had given in Chennai uh, for the APAS meeting. That was equally fascinating. So uh, we will just have time for one or two questions. And uh, if Professor Shinde or Vijay uh, have any questions, uh, we can take them. Uh, so my question to you, Bharat, is, you know, the one of the critical things I have seen in this is the overall coordination and management. The initial parts are important, but as you said, there can be as much as 40 agencies working 
at one time and it's really a nightmare because each one plays the blame game and blames the other so uh, how do you you know it's really personally difficult to supervise this but do you have any suggestions on how to ensure proper and smooth coordination so as to uh, finish the project within the uh, the timeline set yes uh, my uh, most important uh, step that you can take to benefit yourself and relieve yourself from this uh, trouble would be to identify two layer system one is a project management consulting team it will look a bit costly you would think that why should i pay uh, let's say one and a half or two lakhs a month to this people it's that's almost 24 lakhs if it is going to be a one year project or uh, more if it's going to be a one and a half year project which is what typically a project timeline should be from uh, ground breaking to commissioning you know one and a half to two years at the most but that money is absolutely well well utilized let me assure you that because if you have a good pmc and one or two loyal and honest people who can keep coordination with this pmc the overall uh, savings that you will do uh, for example in uh, repeat breaking etc typically a large project ends up anywhere from 8 to 10% now in my project uh, when i did a retro calculation it was only 2% so that 6% benefit of a say a 40 crore project you can understand what the figures are you know so yeah, yes yeah, getting yeah. a good pmc project management consultancy team and one or two very loyal senior people uh, who whom you can trust will not do hanky panky with the finances i think that's that's very very critical uh, any questions which i not really uh, i've been very close to bharat i know all is uh, you know i've been influenced terribly by him thank you so, thank you so i think uh, bharat uh, excellent talk you know like always spot on and really it was good to hear this non orthopedic talk from you and always you know what one thing strikes me whether an orthopedic talk or a non orthopedic talk the involvement which you talk with and uh, really you very nicely said and one of the quotes you mentioned uh, really struck me especially the one by Abraham Lincoln on if you have 8 hours to cut a tree you know i would spend 6 hours sharpening the axe you know, that says a lot so you know that talks about the the planning aspect and the execution is just 20% you know the main thing is as you rightly said 80% is planning and you know if you plan well then you execute well so with that bharat thank you for joining us in spite of you know uh, uh, the rocky celebrations going on in your family we really appreciate this at a short notice you agreed to speak and uh, uh, thank you very much for joining in and uh, please stay on if you have the time to hear vijay bose again speak on a topic of uh, a different uh, thing than arthroplasty and uh, before that uh, before i introduce uh, vijay bose i request uh, dr ajit chinde to ask a question and then we'll go to dr vijay bose there is no question congratulations okay. very yes, well planned things i am very eager to see your hospital whenever is the time i am going to visit to baroda and i am going to see your hospital it will be my pleasure and privilege dr shinde and once again parag thank you so much for uh, uh, allowing me to interact with all of you vijay i look forward to seeing you very soon and uh, all the best to all of you thanks very much i will take your leave with your permission because as i said i have some family gathering social things yes, thanks and our president is also here the indian orthopedic association president oh, sure. dr shiva shankar to say thank you to you i am listening i uh, bharat uh, it was wonderful to listen to your talk i heard it once but even then uh, it's really nice to listen to you once again and uh, really the work you have done and the way you have built uh, uh, parag's father is also the same yes. person In yes. fact, he's yeah, my inspiration. So, Let me tell yeah. you, Doctor Shivan, I can't resist this. I'll just take thirty seconds. You know, if there is one person uh, in our entire fraternity and outside it who has actually uh, uh, inspired me to go into these details, it is the senior Sancheti Saab, who knows and who understands more than even I do about all these issues. You know, and I can tell you stories about how he responded. Uh, Uh, when he came to my hospital and he knew every little aspect of the construction activity but uh, thank you for bringing up that uh, particular point thank you thank you thank you very much thank you dr shiv shankar thank you bharat and really excellent talk thank you so much thank we you. now go to the last talk uh, 
uh, of today's uh, MOA masterclass along with the Bone Joint uh, uh, Celebration Week. And uh, for this, we have none other than Dr. Vijay Post, who actually needs no introduction. Uh, he is the director and a senior consultant at uh, the SRM Institute of Medical Sciences, uh, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, uh, and also the director of the AJRI. All of us know the kind of interest he takes in the complex hip work and also knee work. You know, till uh, a few years, I didn't know that he takes equal interest in knees also. But, uh, you know, his frequent uh, interactions at the Ranawath Orthopedic Meeting, you know, uh, brought his knee side also uh, forward. And uh, really, his hip surfacing uh, surgeries, he has a world record on doing them. He has patients coming all the way from uh, America, from Europe, Middle East, from uh, Southeast Asia to get operated from him. And that part of his needs no introduction. You know, what I've been amazed in this lockdown, and again, an, another facet was disclosed to me, is his interest in diet and exercises. And I always wondered, you know, when he was on the podium, we've uh, uh, shared uh, many platforms together, not only in India, but outside. Where does he get all that energy, that enthusiasm, and that, you know, when he talks, my God, he's, it's so much of force he talks. So, you know, I was always wondering how he got that. And then I got the answer in the lockdown. When I heard his talk, just about three months ago on diet in one of the series uh, which was run by a Tamil Nadu Association on, on diet and various aspects of diet and exercise. And that's where I thought this is a good opportunity to celebrate the bone and joint decade through his talk. Because there's so much of myths, I would say, you know, whether intermittent fasting is good, whether eating at regular intervals is good, whether a keto diet is good. What kind of exercise, whether you're doing weights is good or you're doing aerobics is good or yoga and flexibility is good. There's so much out there in that space. You just Google it and you will go crazy. But I think hearing from an orthopedic surgeon itself for an orthopedic surgeon crowd would be most uh, 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 beneficial at this point of time and the requirement of the hour. So without further ado, let me present to you uh, the most coveted arthroplasty surgeon from India, Dr. Vijay Bose, who's going to speak to us on exercise and diets, how to optimize the benefits. It's all yours, Vijay. Thanks very much, Prag. And I must say that if somebody's enthusiasm is infectious, it's yours. Absolutely <laughs> indefatigable. Uh, so many of these things, online programs, uh, you see, go on. And we just spread the message for juniors and so many other aspects of not only orthopedics. So thanks very much. Uh, I've been inspired you, by you in many ways and your father as well. Uh, greetings to Dr. Shinde, and President of the IOA, Dr. Shiv Shankar. Uh, good evening to you all and good evening to the listeners. So I'll just share my screen now. Yes. Perfect. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah, thanks. Right. So, well. uh, health and uh, wellness for uh, doctors. So, that's the, what uh, Parag asked me to talk today. So, yesterday we had this uh, talk by Shrish Patak. I was really delighted by the talk. I think it was a very inspirational talk. He gave some very important messages and I think he really inspired a lot of people, including me, uh, to go up to an Ironman. Probably I will do an Ironman uh, sometime. But the real issue for most of us is not doing Ironman. But to get it off the sort of the um, uh, bad health that we have these days. So, um, uh, you know, uh, the health is a big uh, topic in my opinion. It's as big as disease. So my talks, uh, I have more than 1,000 slides on them. And uh, my talks are available on YouTube. So you need to... Uh, Google YouTube, the channel is Learning General Surgery LGS and you put my name, you'll get the part three, part two, each is an hour long. Part one will be diet, part two would be the scientific exercise program and part three would be optimizing sleep, breathing improvements and stress reduction. Uh, however, uh, you know, because it is a 40 minute talk today, I won't be able to go into the details of everything, of how we do everything, that won't be possible. But however, today I want to sort of inspire you that you must all uh, you know, take up this fitness journey. I think that's absolutely important for us. I hope I can inspire you for that. And I'll give you some a snapshot of uh, various things so that you can look in more detail on the videos, uh, but you'll get inspired today. 
I also want to highlight the mistakes that we make regarding health and fitness and uh, nothing better to do than learning from mistakes uh, of others. I think, you know, that's very, very important. So, uh, you know, we all have these uh, patients who come to us, maybe a son or daughter of a knee replacement patient. We have done a knee replacement and they're sitting beside and once the uh, consultation of the patient is over, they'd probably ask us, uh, uh, you know, how do I remain healthy and avoid lifestyle diseases? Yeah. So I'm sure you all agree that the current, uh, you know, whatever specialty that we are on today, we'll all tell that uh, you take one of the following, you take a multivitamin tablet, you take an aspirin tablet, you take a calcium and vitamin D3, very common in our, our prescriptions, uh, a statin, you do a H2 receptor antagonist so that you don't get any uh, problem with your, uh, uh, you know, your, uh, you know, stomach and you take a cod liver oil absolute, so it keeps your liver healthy. And you take an antibiotic at the slightest suspicion of any infection, you have a little bit of throat pain, take an antibiotic. And also you eat less, you move more and avoid fats. And I'm sure you will be all are giving this advice. And, uh, and then you will be very healthy, you'll, uh, you'll be fit, um, you know, and then you'll avoid any chronic lifestyle disease. This is an infection that we allopathy people, whatever specialty that we are on, we seem to be dishing out our patients. Not only that, this is what we believe is the gospel truth, and this is what all of us follow. Now, uh, things have become so bad that doctors and health have unfortunately become an oxymoron. It's a really, really sad situation today. Now, if you take a, a, a music director, a Bollywood music director, for example, there are so many. Do you know any music director who is not good in music? Anyone? Can you name? Impossible. Can you uh, name a professional sportsman who is not good in sports? Yeah, no, no, I'm sure there are none. Now, how come so many doctors are unhealthy? Are we not supposed to be the ultimate health professionals? But why are so many, in fact, most of us are unhealthy. Isn't that an oxymoron? It certainly is. So it truly calls for some introspection. Now, when we say, you know, loosely we say this term always, you know, that health is wealth. Uh, then when we ask uh, most doctors, uh, what is health? They'll say, if you don't have any disease, you're healthy. That's what most doctors we, you know, in allopathy would say that. And then if you ask them the next question, how do you find out whether you're healthy? They'll say, you do a master health check. The master health check is a very Indian phenomenon. Very interesting to note that nowhere else in the world, they have this master health checks. Uh, they do a master health check and you'll find out whether you're healthy or not by all these uh, things, master health check. Now, this is a very interesting anecdote. Dr. Devi Shetty is here. Uh, he's a great uh, figure in Indian medicine. I have greatest respect for him. Uh, he has inspired me in many ways. However, uh, when uh, uh, our um, uh, Saurav Ganguly uh, had a heart attack, it was earlier this year, January of this year, that uh, Dr. Devi Shetty had flown from Bangalore to Delhi and he had treated him. And then when he came out of the hospital, all his media were there and we were asking him. It was a great opportunity to tell everyone what is the importance of uh, lifestyle diseases. But what David Shetty said was, Saurav is 48 years old, fit, does not smoke or drink, and does not have any vices. I don't know what vices he meant. If anyone of you know, please do tell me. If we can develop a heart attack, any one of us can develop it, irrespective of any healthy lifestyle we lead. In other words, he said, healthy lifestyle is not important. This is the true reality of India. The only way to prevent it, uh, prevent heart issues, to do regular preventive tests like a CT scan. You know, now we have this... Uh, 64, 128 slice uh, CD scans for heart imaging. Coronary. That's the only way you can prevent heart disease. I mean, what a message to give the public. Really baffling. Now, when you talk about mass health checks, uh, you know, you have this um, current allopathic look is uh, typically, you know, if you have a neighbor, you know, comes to you and says, you know, doc, I'm not able to put my belt for the last uh, few months. Uh, and then his fasting sugar is 102, HDL is 40. Uh, triglyceride is 160, LDL is 140, and BP is 130, 80. So all these parameters are the borderline. They're not terribly wrong. So if you visit a hospital, a corporate hospital or any other hospital, the physician will see you and typically he'll put you on some kind of uh, low uh, antihypertensives, uh, metformin, uh, 500, and a statin, then the low dose statin, and give you advice to eat less and move more. Six months later, you go back to the doctor and you uh, repeat all these values. Uh, they all tend to normal. So the doctor is happy, the patient is happy, the hospital is happy, everyone is happy, but he still is not able to put on the belt. In fact, it's got worse now. So what really this patient had was the beginning of a metabolic syndrome. And uh, the, what these values were, were the smoke from the fire. Somewhere there was some fire 
and what these values are smoke. And instead of putting out the fire, finding what the source of this patient's uh, you know, smoke is, uh, the doctor has put some air freshener so that everybody is happy, values are uh, returned to normal, and so everybody is happy. Now, what he has really done is he has put the patient on a slippery slope, and over some time, he's going to develop chronic illnesses and a lifelong um, you know, thing of taking medicines uh, like diet. So uh, lots and lots of medicines, chronic life, you have put him on a slippery slope towards a life of disease. So we have not corrected where it should. We have put him on a slippery slope. And if I'm able to give you one message today that you know this doesn't work, that we have to work at lifestyle, then my job is done. So these MHC values that we have uh, is really no, so-called normal values are not really normal values. They are only pseudo wellness. So all our values that we have, you know, the textbook normal values must be towards the optimal health side. So if it's not towards the optimal health and it's just normal within quotes, then you are really on a slippery slope waiting to develop some kind of lifestyle diseases. And lifestyle diseases are now absolutely so, so common. So the one point that I want to, uh, you know, convey is that it's wrong to think that absence of disease is optimal health. No way. We doctors are wearing blinders and we have total tunnel vision. All that we see day in and day out is diseases. So we have no concept of what is health. Neither do they teach us this in medical school or in, in postgraduate training. So we're looking only at disease. So everything we're interpreting within the prism of disease, which is what the real mistake is. I think it needs a really a fresh perspective. I think you know health is as big a topic as disease and we have no clue about what health is. So we all know about disease intervention. So you have... Uh, end stage osteoarthritis, a parag or anybody would do a knee replacement and the patient is fine. So we all know, and if you have a cardiac problem, coronary problem, a college put a stent and the patient will become all right. So we know all about disease intervention, but we don't know anything about, and when I ask doctors, you know, uh, you know, what health intervention that you do, they ask me health intervention. What is health intervention? They're not even aware of health intervention. So disease intervention is, you know, sickness, drug therapy, surgery that we do. All doctors and hospitals are focused on disease intervention. Now, as I said, the medical textbook normal range, or, you know, if somebody carries a normal MSC, they think, you know, proudly they'll display it as if they have achieved something. This is pseudo wellness. This is not wellness. It's only an absence of disease. It does not mean that you are healthy. So disease intervention is completely different. So now we have very objective parameters. We're all scientists. We've gone through medical school and we need objective indices. And that's where I think the, the, uh, the sphere of health was failing so far was Health was uh, handled so far by, you know, by nutritionists, uh, you know, yoga people, etc. But the real people who know the human body well are us doctors, allopathists. We should be handling health, not somebody else. It's really tragic that we say we are nothing to do with health. We are the experts at health. We should be the experts. So there are some key metabolic parameters are there. So they must be improved to a normal range. This is indicative of good health. Is totally ignored by doctors and hospitals. All doctors and hospitals are looking for is do you have disease so that they can intervene. They're not interested in whether you have health or not. And there are also key fitness indices. It's important to monitor wellness of the population. So these can be progressively improved. So the uh, we now have 15 indices, five key metabolic parameters, fasting blood glucose, HbA1c, and fasting insulin. Fasting insulin is a very important parameter. You have HSCRP, you have a lipid profile. Uh, and we do not take you know, LDL into account. I'll talk a little bit about LDL later on. Uh, we want to do some liver function tests and blood pressure. So it's not like a question of normal values. You must keep on improving these values. Very, very important. Coming to fitness indices, we have BMI, waist circumference. Yesterday, Sirish mentioned about VO2 max. VO2 max is such an important index, and that's what we must all aim for. Not looking at some, some pseudo parameter that we see in the MSB. Get healthier and healthier, our VO2 max must keep improving more and more. Then we have one rep max for your muscle, you need a balance score, flexibility score, a sleep score, and a blood, blood oxygen level test or a bold score. These are the uh, 15 parameters now, objective parameters that we have established, which must be constantly improved to improve health. Not just say I'm healthy, why? Because I don't have any disease. No, no, no. You must keep improving these so that you get better and better and, and you get healthy. Now, the very important point that I want to make is that is health holistic or compartmentalized? So we have, you know, our Indian science of Ayurveda. Ayu, of course, he means life. Veda is study. So there's a life study. And we have all these uh, seven datus, the three doshas, the pancha mahabhutas, the five elements. Uh, 
uh, all that as part of Ayurveda. Not only that, we have the Ayurveda stresses are how the body and soul is related to the cosmos or the universe. So it's very universal the approach in Ayurveda. Whereas in Alapadi, this is the American Heart Association has released a brochure which says exercise to do for heart health, focal heart health, not for the body, but heart. That, that we are really compartmentalizing things. Whereas Ayurveda, I can see, is so holistic. So let me tell you, um, my doctor friends, that disease intervention can be focal. So if you have knee osteoarthritis or you have gall bad disease, you can do a cholecystectomy and the patient will be all right. You don't have to know anything else. Disease intervention is, can be focal. However, remember that health intervention is always holistic. And it is one other point I want to convey to you. Please do not divide health into subspecialty health. It doesn't work that way. You can't have a healthy heart in a, in a rubbish body. It just doesn't work that way. So, so wrong concepts that we have. So we may or may not believe that harmony of the body and mind, the soul and the universe, as the Ayurveda study is necessary for. You may believe in it, you may not believe in it, that's okay. But however, you must at least not divide the physical body into subspecialty ones for health and wellness. And Please do not call this, you know, typically we talk about you know, heart fitness, gut health, mental and neuro wellness, women wellness, bone and joint health technique, or immune boosting. Absolutely flawed concepts. You know, at the time of the COVID, uh, doctors were taking kilos and kilos of vitamin C, thinking they are going to boost their immune system. What is the role of vitamin C in, in, in uh, the immune system? If you have a deficiency, your immune system will get a hit. But once you have come to that level, normal vitamin C, you may take even a truckload of vitamin C, it will not touch you. It will not increase. In, I'm sure it does harm as well. So the how to improve immune? You must improve your whole body's fitness levels. Same for everybody. Or you want to improve your gut health, you must move everything. You just cannot eat a tablet and become... And heart fitness, of course, the cardiologists are the most uh, at fault. They keep focusing only on the heart. and on. So please do not subdivide and uh, you know into subspecialties. We are also at fault. We always think we can improve the, the knee of the patient. You cannot improve the knee of the patient. You can treat knee disease, but you cannot improve uh, the knee of the patient. You have to improve either, either the patient is healthy or not healthy. The knee cannot be healthy or unhealthy. It doesn't work that way. So remember, gentlemen, health and wellness is holistic and all organ systems are intricately related and interdependent. Principles of improvement done through lifestyle is common to all organ systems. You cannot improve only one organ. It doesn't work that way. It is wrong to think that focal intervention can be done to achieve a specific, you eat cod liver oil, your liver will improve. There's nothing more foolish than that. Absolutely. So health is holistic. Only disease intervention is subspecialty. We are all used to subspecialty in disease intervention that we think we can also make health into subspecialties. It doesn't work that way at all. So, so what do we need now? We need a universal, comprehensive, uh, scientific template for wellness. So uh, whatever may be your specialty, whether you are a hepatologist or a cardiologist or you are an orthopedic surgeon, the interventions for getting health is same. It is same across specialties because you are going to improve the health of the person. You are not going to improve the health of the knee or the heart or the liver. So the primary interventions that we do now, I have personally uh, you know, done this for about 600 doctors now. And the response has been absolutely fantastic. So the primary intention is, you know, we have a three macro diet and hydration. We have fasting is very important. And then we work on a 4D exercise program. So I told you about these parameters. And, then, and we know how now we can dial the, the macros, the carbs, the fats and proteins to get the desired effect that we want. Hydration is important. And then fasting is very, very important, which I'll cover a little bit. And now we call it the four dimensional exercise program. So we'll talk about four dimensions. So these are the primary interventions that you must do. Why is it called primary? There's no point doing other interventions before you do these three primary interventions. Once you do this primary, there are secondary interventions which are optimizing sleep and you must improve your breathing as well. And you must reduce your stress. Absolutely critical to do that. And once you do the secondary ones, then we go on to the tertiary ones, which will be sunlight. You need to some kind of brain workout and clean air. So none of this can be ignored. If you ignore sunshine, for example, you are not going to get health. So all these are important. And this is the universal protocol for everyone. The only exception is children may be slightly different. Sports nutrition can be slightly different. But for the rest of us, whatever specialty you are, health is health. It is, doesn't have any subspecialties. So what has been the allopathic strategy for the last few decades? Uh, we told you know that you, know, you eat less, uh, eat small portions, eat uh, fat-free and low-fat. And we know that over the last 50 years, we have been giving this advice, the whole world has plunged into 
uh, chronic sickness. We all become obese and obese. And the strategy has been a complete failure over the last 50 years. And the obesity pandemic that we know, that we see day in and day out, is in full swing. So this, we now say, has got a perfect 50-year failure record. It's advice. You know, eat uh, less, move more, avoid fat. The strategy has been a universal failure all across the world. So not admitting to a mistake is a bigger mistake. So it's time to admit this mistake and move on and find something better to advise our patients. So if you see the instance of lifestyle diseases, all other things, you know, whether you take uh, non-lifestyle uh, diseases, you know, whether you take uh, uh, or coming down, you know, communicable disease, for example, uh, accident uh, care, for example, so much better over the recent years, isn't it? Communicable diseases have almost been eradicated. Acute interventions, degenerative diseases, congenital diseases, transplant medicine, oncological interventions, and even intrauterine interventions have all leapfrogged over the last decades. However, if you see the lifestyle diseases, they reverse the direction. They've all taken a nose dive from diabetes to heart disease to obesity, complete. And uh, this uh, article from Lancet says that most of us have uh, more than five ailments, chronic uh, ailments, uh, you know, absolutely, but all the other things are improving, the, the, the improvement in technology, whereas the lifestyle diseases are taking a nose dive. Somebody has to answer why, why this is happening. So it is important to remember that our ancestors were healthy 50 to 60 years ago. So although they didn't have any technology, they lived a, you know, a relatively a very healthy life. Now we have all the technology and the improvements, but we have a very bad uh, life with, with serious uh, lifestyle disorders that we have. Now somebody has to answer, why is this so? So let us try and answer a bit. Uh, so the first rule of, uh, you know, uh, of, the, of the program is that any type of diet that leaves a person hungry is doomed to fail. So you may tell the patient eat 1,200 calories. And the patient is hungry after that is, is absolute failure. And then, of course, uh, many of us also prescribe these meal replacement powders. They are the most unhealthy things that you can ever prescribe. Please do not prescribe these meal replacement. Although they come in very tasty chocolate and strawberry uh, flavors. So gross calorie reduction and hunger will put the body in conservation mode and shut off metabolism. So when you take calories again, the body will latch on it like a sponge. And you'll put on uh, weight much quickly than you lost. Okay, and this is called as fat overshooting. So this sort of a yo-yo, you sort of starve yourself, then you eat something, you, you blow up, very bad thing to do. Now we have all these intensive weight loss retreats in Kerala and elsewhere, you go there, you, you stay as a hermit for a week, uh, for, the, for a few weeks, and you lost weight, and then you come back home, and the next month again you put on. These are the yo-yo uh, way, very bad to do that. And again, again that we find that Blindly following fat diets can be very dangerous. Now, people have, you know, out of desperation, have taken to all these keto diet and Atkins diet, and detox and South Beach diet. And uh, so what are fat diets? Fat diets, diets that promise quick weight loss, usually require you to eat a specific type of food. And we know that, you know, that fat diets don't work. So the only thing that you can do is quick fixes don't work and could actually be very, very, very dangerous. So the only way of going about it is you must understand the science behind it and why we're doing what, and then applying it to yourself and your patients and your, you know, your neighbors, your family, etc. So we must get out of the mindset that one does not, if one does not smoke and drink, they're leading a healthy lifestyle. If you ask somebody, you know, are you healthy? I'm very healthy. I don't have any disease. I don't smoke and I don't drink. Well, that is completely not correct. So we can actually damage our body quite significantly by the food, by the food that we eat. The food can the eat could be direct toxins to various organs. It could cause low-grade inflammation of the body. It could derange your favorable gut bacteria, the microbiome, as we call it. There could be intolerance or allergy. So there are various mechanisms by which food can damage you seriously. And then when, when wrong timing of eating and constant feeding that now we have can damage you quite significantly. Now, again, inappropriate hormone response by eating the wrong food at the wrong time, wrong proportion of constants, the pace of eating, eat very fast, etc. So various ways in which you can damage your body but just by food. So it's not only drinking and smoking which will cause damage, food will probably cause more damage. So as they say, the foods you eat can either be the safest and the most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. Very important. Yeah. Now, we now have this concept of clean eating. That means you avoid foods that damage your body 
and you do not need to count calories because we've been telling patients to count calories for the last 50 years and this is not worth because I told you why you put them on a, you shut down their metabolism and then they sort of eat with a vengeance later on and everything falls to places. So each one has got different foods that will cause, you know, the various toxins, uh, the inflammatory food and, and derange the gut microbiome, etc. However, there are common culprits. This is the most important thing. Refined sugars, processed foods, fast food and packaged foods. These are the common culprits causing damage in whatever mechanism. There are, of course, are bits of other foods as well in each respective area, but these are common. So please, uh, you know, you have to avoid refined sugars, processed foods, fast food and packaged foods. It's like much worse than smoking and drinking. It can really damage your body. So can the food that we eat be more harmful than smoking? Most likely, yes. So uh, this was a study again in uh, Lancet where they said, you know, that, that bad food can actually harm much more than, uh, than smoking. So if we take sugar, for example, you know, uh, uh, John Yutkin said, if only a small fraction of what is already known about the effects of sugar were to be revealed in relation to any other material used as a food additive, that metal would promptly be banned. And you know, pure white and deadly is a term that we use to describe cocaine, you know, bad effects of cocaine. And the same words that he uses to describe sugar, the same vein, you know, describing cocaine and white sugar. Uh, I think there's a lot of relevance to it. Yeah. Sugar can be a real toxin. So just like we say, smoking can affect from your hair to your toe. Sugar can also affect, processed sugar can affect from right from your, uh, from your hair to your toe, all. And it's the main culprit in all lifestyle disorders, whether it's Alzheimer's. Now more and more lifestyle disorders are coming up. Metabolic syndrome, polystic ovarian disease, non-alcoholic liver failure, very common in our country, cancer, stroke, our, our own specialty, fibromyalgia. All the patients coming to fibromyalgia have metabolic syndrome. And we don't understand that. And then we give them some NSAIDs, thinking that the fibromyalgia will go away. Fibromyalgia will not go away. They all have metabolic syndrome. that is manifesting in all specialties. Every specialty will see it the same monster, and we in orthopedic surgery, we see as joint pains and fibromyalgia. We must recognize this metabolic syndrome. Now, the real tragedy is that if somebody asks us, uh, tell me some good things to eat and drink, we'll probably recommend Horlicks and Boost and Bone Vita, um, that they are the worst drinks possible. They're nothing short of poisons. And if you look at the constituents, they're all processed sugars, all of them. They're nothing, I mean, they're sheer poisons. And uh, they're probably the most harmful. And what good thing to eat if somebody asks, you know, we'll say probably biscuits are most healthy. Most doctors would say that. But bis uh, biscuits are no, uh, are equally harmful. All they contain is processed sugar and maida. Absolute toxins. But this is what we have been ingrained. This is the power of money. The multinationals through the advertisement campaigns have totally fooled us, including the doctor community, that this is healthy food. This is the worst food possible on the planet. So are we swallowing sugar-coated science? Yes, absolutely. And if somebody asks for a healthy dessert, we'll probably say this, you know, this is a fruit, yogurt, it's contains fruit, it contains yogurt, healthy. No, and it's no fat. It is the most unhealthy thing that you can ever think of. So we have to understand the three macros. So all three macros are very important, okay? So carbs, proteins, and fats, all are very important. So the fundamental common sense principles of diet is all, as the body needs all the three macros, it is illogical to say any other macro is bad for health. However, proportion is crucial. Must learn to dial the proportion as indicated. All natural food is good, and all processed refined is bad. Although the companies have brainwashed, thinking that you know this processed food, we have some conflicts. It has some vitamins, irrelevant vitamins, and they fortified the vitamins, and we all buy that. That's the you know how they cheat us. So let not anybody tell you that carbs is bad, uh, fats are bad. All three macronutrients are, that's why we have it in the body, by evolutionary engineering. All three macros are important. Our proportion is absolutely important. Now, the fats has been, you know, incriminated in disease for a long time, especially <coughs> cardiac disease. But actually, fats are very, very important. So let not any cardiologist or let not any nutrition tell you that fats are bad. It's very, very important for the functioning of our body. Now, based on the American advisories that they gave us, uh, we went in the whole world, you know, follows US in every uh, sphere of life. And all these things came from the US. They all gave false advisories 
uh, company influenced uh, material that they and the whole world follow them and are, that's why the whole world is in our trouble with chronic lifestyle diseases now regarding oils you know the americans said that these are the healthy heart healthy oils the sunflower oil the canola oil uh, corn oil these are all you know healthy oils and natural oil you know like butter coconut oil they said is not healthy and you must avoid that all india when it do the sunflower oil business uh, absolutely wrong advice and that's the reason why we have such a incidence of heart disease today in india today absolute so remember that nature does not make bad fats factories do so all that nature gives us is so so healthy and all that comes in a pack is 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 absolutely uh, uh, damaging for health the very important point about oils is that you know uh, the coconut oil the mustard the groundnut oil or natural sources of oil you can cold press them They're like our ancestors used to do and we get oil good natural source but all these oil so called hot healthy oils cannot be cold pressed it doesn't contain natural oil so they have to be treated chemically and this, what is surprising is that this chemical process that is undergo shares principles of petroleum refining it's like the same uh, chemicals that they use in refining of petroleum they use in the refining of these oils and that's what the americans have told us is hot healthy oil and we are now been using it and we land in a serious problem okay and india is only going in the wrong way and now our, our familiar figure saura gangli advertisement says use this sunflower oil and that's where we get all cheated so i'll touch a bit on uh, uh, you know uh, this oil and uh, fat so you know the cardiologists keep telling us and our general medicine uh, friends keep telling us you know ldl 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 now ldl is the biggest bogus that you can think of the reason i'm saying that is that and they say you must take statins now when you do all these lifestyle changes that you're talking about positive lifestyle changes which is you do a natural all uh, three macro balance diet you do a scientific exercise program you do fasting your ldl will go up i i'm not aware that shrish is listening but shrish would uh, testify to that that if you do all good things uh, you know uh, health interventions your ldl will go up and our cardiologists tell us ldl is wrong i mean how can it be wrong okay so nowadays we only insist on the atherogenic lipid diet not ldl so what we want is that when you do these uh, lifestyle changes positive lifestyle changes our hdl should go up my hdl has increased so dramatically after i adopted all, adopted all this our triglyceride must come down and then now we call as apo b that is the subset of uh, ldl which is really important and you must not look at ldl levels and prescribe people statins absolutely wrong concept that the cardiologist have now as we know you know all our you know trials it gets fixed by the companies you know manipulated we know so many examples in orthopedics so just because something is published something there is a study that says is very visual uh, it doesn't mean you know now we know all that you know so ldl c that is what we call as ldl commonly uh, exercise has got no effect on ldl very surprising natural sources of you know if you take a three macro natural source it actually increases your ldl intermittent fasting does not do anything to ldl so the only way to uh, to reduce ldl is two things you take statins or you take a fat depleted unnatural diet artificial diet there are only two things that can do so going by ldl is the most ridiculous thing that you can ever think of and that's what all our cardiology friends see i told you health is holistic now if you take a statin Statin, they say, will help your heart and prevent stroke. But they also acknowledge the cardiologists acknowledge that it will damage your liver, it will damage your muscle, it will cause diabetes. Statins, but it will help your heart. It cannot be. It cannot damage your liver and help your heart. It's just not possible. Common sense tells us that. And the cardiologists keep on prescribing statin after statin after statin. And how wrong can they be? So this is the basic tenet of nature. When will we ever learn this? we have been fine tuned by millions of years of evolutionary engineering to be perfectly capable for eating processing and utilizing any fresh naturally occurring edible source of food from our nutritional needs without any harm the only caveat is that we should not overeat any one component keep in mind that our body has been custom built for available natural food and it's completely illogical to alter natural food making it low fat etc completely illogical this modification and processing to make it healthier is a murky dubious entity often hiding as evidence based science from reality driven by dollar power it's time to call the bluff so all this which we are told by the american association health association that this is healthy is the biggest rubbish they are most 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 unhealthy food okay 
This was never eaten by our ancestors and they were healthy. And once they said that food can be manipulated to be healthy food, all the troubles began. So remember that our body rejects and becomes inflamed and chronically sick when artificial man-made processed food of any kind is consumed. We are putting the wrong fuel. Our body was not made for, made for artificial foods. Our body is made for natural, wholesome foods. That's where the problem comes. So we talk about, you know, the, uh, you know, our Indian diet is very rich in carbs. You know, so this is the interesting example. Poi gras is a delicacy in France where they overfeed the ducks by putting a tube in and they give it carbs. And not for years and years. They give it only for one month. They force feed the, uh, uh, the ducks uh, for, uh, for one month. And within one month, the liver expands to uh, 10 times its size. So just one month, the liver expands. So if we overeat the carbs, the proportion is wrong. That's the common mistake in the Indian diet. Then our liver will have fatty liver. That's why we're having fatty liver. Not because of any genetic disease, but because we're overloading ourselves. And whenever you take an Indian diet, a South Indian diet, for example, you have carbs in the morning, carbs in the afternoon, and carbs at lunch. No wonder your liver will get fatty. The proportion is completely wrong. So now we say, uh, how to dial your macros for the Indian diet is that you must bring down carb proportion of at least 40% by volume. We're not interested in calories. Calorie countings will not work in the long term. So by volume, you bring it clean eating. Don't eat rubbish food. Eat wholesome, full food. Bring the carbs down to 40%. So the fats and proteins is at least 60%. That's all that you need to do. And the way we do it is we have a small plate. Then we are able to gauge what the proportion of the macros that you have. Uh, if you want a, a, a second helping or a third helping, you can have it. No problem. Don't go hungry. But the proportion, you made in the proportion. Okay, as long as you made in the proportion and you're able to eat a full plate with the correct proportion, you can have a second helping, third helping, and a fourth helping also. This is a natural way. This is how our ancestors ate. This is how ancient man ate. And this is how we should also eat. Okay, dialing is by volume, no calorie counting. Calorie counting will not work in the long term. Now, uh, one uh, uh, slide about fasting. Now, when we eat food, we signal the body that food is now available and therefore we must store reserves for time that's unavailable and the body goes into an energy conserving mode. So the ancient man didn't have food all the time. He didn't have a refrigerator. So whenever he killed an animal and he ate the food or he found some plant source and ate the food, he had to store it and that's why we have fat. That's why we have fat. So we find that the liver and the muscle can store small amount of energy as carbs. It's often compared to a wallet. However, the fat in the body it can store unlimited amount of energy as fat, often compared to a bank. So our fat in our body has an important source, but not your abdominal fat and visceral fat. Fat elsewhere is the important source of energy for our body. Very, very important. Okay. Now, when we stop eating or call fasting, we signal the body that food is not available anymore. And therefore, the body taps into the body reserves, which is the fat, and gets the energy. So we must all get fat adapted, as we call it now. If you keep on stacking all the time, without any interval, your body will depend only on carbs for its metabolism. Therefore, if you go without food for two hours, you get panicky because your body is not able to, 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 um, to utilize the fat stores. But however, when you learn about fasting, you know how your body can tap into your fat. That's so important for everyone. So once, we, uh, once I or anybody else start fasting, we never get tired because whenever we don't, you know, uh, don't have food, our, our fat gets utilized. And that's how you don't get, you know, fatty deposits in your abdomen, your visceral fat. Not only that, that fat provides energy for you whenever. And that's how man was built. He needs two sources of energy, carbs for immediate needs and fats, uh, stored fat for energy. Now, if you don't know, you keep on eating all the time and not fasting, you will never be fat adapted and you never learn how to utilize your fat. And that is the one line about fasting. So food is much more than what we think it is. It's a complex entity conveying many signals to the body. So the changing views on diet, in summary, is that, uh, you know, we were, 50 years we gave this advice, eat low fat, eat small meals frequently, monitor calories, and eat less to produce deficit. And over 50 years we know, we have not made any change. We have gone from bad to worse. So what are the change in modern uh, strategies? Don't count your calories. Eating till you feel full, no starving. Proportion of macros is critical. Only 40% max must be carbs. Concept of good calories and bad calories. Avoid bad calories. Clean eating. Avoid damage by food. Dial in the three essential macros as required. 
Don't overload the cough. They'll cause fat deposits. There is a rainbow diet for micros. So we talked about macros. So you must eat all colors of the of the you know whatever available vegetables and fruits in a week. You must cover all colors. That we call the rainbow diet. You take care of the gut microbiome. You have to eat probiotics and prebiotics from natural food. Essential role of live food. Live food is uncooked food. So important to eat salads. That will give you the uh, the uh, live food as we call it. Hydration is important. Four tall glasses when not thirsty during the day. Not consuming pro-inflammatory food and getting rid of abdominal fat. Consuming and consume green tea or fruit infusion whenever you need a drink. Not you know one of these horlicks or bone vita. Avoiding the perils of constant feeding. Constant feeding will not make you fat adapted and will kill you in the long term. So uh, five minutes I'll cover exercise. Uh, Parag, is that okay? Yeah, that is okay. You can take uh, up to ten minutes. We have ten minutes more. Okay, great. So, uh, is any exercise good exercise? So, the common mistakes that we make regarding exercise. So, we all think you know if we just say you know uh, eat less and work more, uh, is that good advice that we're giving our patients? So, any exercise is a stress reliever, no doubt. Any exercise will lubricate some joints to a certain extent, but any exercise is better than no activity at all. Will give you a sense of well-being. But it may not give you the metabolic benefit, commonest mistake. So the reported benefit may be a placebo effect in many cases. So people say, I did a bit of walking, I felt better. It's a more of a placebo effect. So this any exercise, you know, is a good as a placebo, but doesn't give you any metabolic effect. So I'm sure we all see these patients, especially women, you know, who are very fat. They come to us and say, doctor, from morning to night, I'm working in my house, doing various household chores. I'm still so fat. Now the answer is they are not doing it scientifically. And they have not come into the zone that will cause weight loss. They are still in warm-up zone. That's the reason why they have the problem. So heart rate zones during exercise are signals that we give the body do different things: to burn fat, do aerobic, do anaerobic, or to improve your VO2 max. So heart rate zones are so so critical to understand. Now, when you are below this minimum level of 60 percent, even if you work all day, you are not going to burn any fat. Absolutely no fat. You are going to burn anything, so that's the reason why all these women are caught in this trap, and you must advise them accordingly. The intensity is not enough to cause, uh, you know, calorie burning uh, effect. So uh, Sirish also mentioned that in this day and age, you must monitor this by a health device, by health watch, or health band. Absolutely critical. Now parameters like they say, sweating is not allowed in our country. Very hot, and remember that fat is eliminated through breath. So you must have intensity of activity must be there. Now, if somebody says, you know, I will measure your pres uh, blood pressure by looking at your pulse. So we agree with that. So we need accurate readings of what we are doing. So I think today, 2021, you need to have a health device for you to get healthy. Simple as that. The four dimensions to scientific fitness: uh, flexibility and mobility, one; uh, stamina and endurance or cardio is one; the Muscle strength and bulk is one. Burning fat and calories is the fourth one. This, all four dimensions are very important. Commonest mistake for everyone that we see, they will ignore one thing. They'll say, this patient was doing yoga every day for four hours and he still had a heart attack. Of course they had, because they are ignoring all the other components. They're being only one component of flexibility. No wonder they had a health problem. So you must learn to look at it in a holistic way, in the four dimensions. So these four are all world-class athletes, you know, absolute world-class athletes. Uh, they are all internationally uh, renowned athletes. Um, now, if you look at them, these parameters that we talked about, spin parameters, they will be very, very bad. Some will be very good, of course, but the rest would be absolutely bad because it's not a holistic exercise program. Whereas if you take sports like tennis, uh, basketball, hockey, etc., you'll find that these uh, athletes will have very ideal parameters. Because these four give you a good balance of all these four dimensions. That's a very fundamental point. So the four dimensions we must all do without you miss one component, you're going to suffer. So the four dimensions of flexibility and mobility. It's not that you must do yoga or a lot of other, whatever you like. You like yoga, that's fine. There's a lot of other alternatives, calisthenics, calisthenics pilates, etc., where you work on your flexibility, mobility, balance, and core. You look at my talk on YouTube, we go into detail of all these things. Stamina and endurance is known as cardio or low intensity steady state exercises, whether you walk, jog, swim, zumba, or whatever thing that you like. It's important that you do an activity that you like. And now we have the best way to burn fat is doing a hit. High interval, uh, high intensity interval training is hit. 
Uh, typically, we would use it either a, a bicycle or do skipping. And they're very important to restrict exercises and weights. So all these four components are important. And if anybody uh, misses out on a component, they will not get holistic health. Absolutely important with that. So the implications of intensity of exercise is signaling the body earlier. So this is how we do it. So the maximum heart rate formula is 220 minus your age. So suppose if you are in the 50 to 55 age group, 220 minus 50 is 170 is your maximum heart rate. So this chart is there, you can Google it. And then we want to be in this zone. If you want to have you know, an aerobic exercise, you must be in this zone. Uh, your heart rate must be between 119 and 136 for an age group of 50, for an age of 50. If you are in this zone, you'll be doing cardio. If you go above this zone, you'll be going into anaerobic zone. And if you, uh, you are below this zone, you will be burning calories, but you'll not be building up your cardio. Very simple. As long as you understand that, it becomes very simple. So you, can, you have to monitor, keep your heart zone where you want to get the desired effects. So just because working from morning to uh, night at home will not give you any benefit unless your heart zone is in the zone that you desire and what you want to achieve by this exercise. So everyone must know these three magic numbers for your age group. So my age group is 50 to 55. So I will have 102, 119, 136. So once I know these three numbers and I have this watch, I know what I want out of whatever exercise activity that I do. So each age group must have their own three uh, numbers. To know that. So, so today in 2021, you must have these things to build health. Now, if you have a car, you know, I always tell this example, a car doesn't have an airbag, doesn't have a music system. Won't the car run? Of course the car will run. But it's not acceptable in 2021. That's where we are. You need, to, you, you need these things, full stop. So you need to have some kind of health device ranging from 3000 to, you know, it can go very high. You need to have a digital weighing machine. You have to weigh yourself every single day. You need to have a tape measure and you need to have some weights. Absolute requirement. Otherwise you won't be healthy, full stop. Just because you eat some statins, don't think you'll become healthy. It's the principle of adaptability and overload. A lot of patients will come and tell us, uh, doc, I've been walking uh, two kilometers for five years, you know, and uh, it's a very good. But I must tell you that that exercise is not of any benefit to you. Why? Because it might have been beneficial in the first year or second year, but then your body will get adapted to that. And unless you increase your exercise, you're not going to get any benefits out of it. So that's the principle of adaptability, especially for cardio. And you must overload so that you get improvement. Absolutely. Otherwise, your body will get adapted, adaptable to that level. In terms. So somebody says, I walked a kilometer for five years. First year was good. Then it was completely useless for him. So what's the principle of reversibility? Now, if you stop doing exercise, you will lose it, especially cardio. And remember that the time taken to fit, lose fitness will be two to three times faster the time that you have to gain fitness. Now, specific to orthopedics, should women and older people do weights? A lot of people ask us this question. The emphatic answer is yes. Now, we all talk about osteoporosis and we give all sorts of drugs to prevent osteoporosis. I think we're climbing the wrong tree. It is not the osteoporosis that matters. It's the sarcopenia, the age later sarcopenia that matters, not the, the, the bone loss. So muscle loss will occur with the age. And we know that you know, our peak muscle is around 23 of years, and then we are all on a downward slope. Now, why is it important that we must do uh, uh, you know, weights and address the sarcopenia? It's absolutely a critical point. Now, it's not that you want to look better. It is that difference between mobility and immobility. So in your elder age, if you're immobile, dependent on others for your day-to-day -day activity, that is because of your sarcopenia. Now, doing exercises, varied exercises in your older age will prevent you from being you know, dependent on others. To me, I would rather die than be dependent on others for my day-to-day -day activities, honestly. So it makes a huge difference between life and death, doing these exercises in an elderly age so that you are independent. Absolutely critical. We are on a downward slope, no doubt about it. We will all have sarcopenia, no doubt about it. But the difference is being independent and not independent. And please concentrate on sarcopenia. So this is the, uh, you know, when people ask, how do you strengthen bones? You always say you take calcium supplements and vitamin D. I'm sure we all give this advice. I also used to give this advice. That's absolutely wrong advice. Just like the vitamin C, vitamin D will help you as long as vitamin deficiency is there. Once you have enough vitamin D, even if you take, you know, 10 kilos of vitamin D, it's not going to improve your bone strength. Absolutely, same with calcium as well. So now we know that it's a muscle bone unit. One must not look at it separately. And really what will strengthen bone is strengthening the muscle around it. 
that is what strengthen bones not eating calcium and vitamin d please don't give this advice to your patients so now we know that you know there is the thing of osteosarcopenia so if you keep the muscles in shape bones will take care of itself as long as you don't have any vitamin deficiency the bones will take care of itself so how can you improve bone strength by improving the muscles around it not by eating some chemical to improve bone strength that's not the bones how going to strengthen improving the muscles around the bone is going to keep the bones more strong now we sarcopenia is much more important than osteoporosis should everyone have access to a gym no not necessarily at home you can do intelligent weighted exercises a kettlebell swing for example will involve all muscle groups in the body weighted exercise all muscle groups in the body so uh, we now have this uh, you know uh, for weighted exercise you have to understand this uh, number of repetitions low rep range is less than 5 which will give you strength mid rep range is uh, around 10 which will give you muscle shape and hypertrophy which are interested in and greater than 15 will give you endurance so anybody who starts off with weighted exercise do select an exercise or a weight which will allow you to do in the mid rep range that's the basic rule you start off then of course you can progress to other things everything is given in my talk in detail and you know like anything else this has to be progress whether your 10 rep max increases or not now this is the important slide so you must understand the principles behind exercises this person is able to do 30 pushups it's an ideal aerobic exercise that very common exercise now you can make this by putting a load on your back into a resisted anaerobic exercise what was the aerobic exercise has now become an anaerobic exercise and is able to do only 10 reps okay so it becomes now you can do it in a very fast way and then that becomes a hit exercise same exercise becomes you can modify it. so a classical aerobic exercise can be converted into an anaerobic central or a classical anaerobic exercise like weighted exercise can be converted to an anaerobic peripheral so remember that both central and peripheral aerobic and anaerobic is an essential so if you understand the principles then you know what to target and what benefit to get but remember that any anaerobic exercise that you do will need to have 48 hours rest before you do the next uh, sirish also talked about rest today is important of rest is very important now cardiac implications of exercise we know that visceral fat is the seat of inflammation in the body and uh, who has the healthiest heart now if somebody who's just only long distance running only aerobic you can see the muscles not well developed at all and this uh, this is not healthy the patient has got a, a volume overload of the heart now this guy a bodybuilder has got you know a, a hypertrophy a concentric hypertrophy of the heart so both these hearts are not good the ideal would be a balance they have good shape muscles not hypertrophy not wasted muscle and then you will have a good heart okay so this is how we know so uh, any extreme of this is very bad running to death the long distance runners with poor muscle will have uh, very early they die bodybuilders also die young so we don't want to go into extremes of one thing important of a balanced exercise program and you must have good shape of the muscle that's very important so skeletal muscle and heart muscle are both tired muscle and has the same response to exercise from a metabolic standpoint so how to find out whether you have a good heart muscle or not to to assess certain parameters expensive scans are not we always say scans to you just have a mirror if you have belly fat you have the equal amount of fat inside your abdomen visceral fat you don't have to measure it with a scan belly fat means same amount you have inside and you have toned muscle outside you have very good heart musculature if you have belly fat at the same amount you have visceral fat if you have good muscle the heart muscle is healthy you don't need any expensive scan so don't fall in the trap saying i'm not dying so physical appearance does not matter to me so i don't exercise it's not a question of appearance it's a question of health it's so so important so body composition is not a matter of looking good it's about being healthy i'll probably skip this slide so in 21st century population worldwide is sinking into chronic sickness so we have insulin resistance obesity low grade chronic inflammation all is and this is you know churning out this chronic metabolic disorders in all of us and a 21st century response has to be you know we are typical responses eat this tablet for this that tablet for this that tablet for this and it'll be all right now remember gentlemen take home message is that lifestyle disease cannot be cured by drugs one has to address the source absolutely important so i'd like to end by saying physician heal thyself before it's too late i uh, thank you for attention thanks for all thank you thank you so much that was such a excellent talk vijay i think uh, you have an alternative career ready to be a fitness and a wellness consultant 
believe me, I've also had these, uh, you know, sessions with dietitians and, uh, you know, wellness consultants. And uh, as you rightly said initially, you know, the, the, the people who are not supposed to be in the business. And, but the way you structured the whole thing, the overview you gave was phenomenal. I think this 45 minutes talk, uh, if somebody hears, we'll get a complete perspective of good health in uh, the 21st century. And uh, you gave a lot of nice examples. It's not just like the absence of disease is good health. You know that struck a chord. You know it's it's so so nicely explained. Uh, just we'll have one or two questions. Uh, Shinde sir, do you have any questions? While he's thinking, I have one question. Just very quickly, if you have the time, two three minutes. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. Right. So, 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 a lot of things have been talked about this keto diet of late. You know, where you have high fats and low protein and low carbs. That's what I have understood about keto. But uh, is that a good thing to do? Because you stressed on the slide like 40, 30, 30. So, in this, you are not following that principle. Uh, so, is it a bad thing to do keto diet? As, as I said, when you talk about lifestyle, uh, when you say lifestyle disease, you know, that means there's something wrong that we're doing in the lifestyle. But which lifestyle are we comparing to? That we must ask ourselves. We're not comparing to a Mediterranean diet. We're not coming to a Japanese diet. What we're comparing is to the diet, the lifestyle that our ancestors led. That's what changes, the reason changes have caused problems. So we want to go back to that. Now, nobody, our ancestors didn't know it's keto diet and all that. Yeah. So it's basically a natural diet and all three macros are important. However, Keto diet basically means low carb. Okay, now the low carb uh, you need when you want to have a weight loss. So it's okay, perfectly okay when you have two, three months keto diet, you want to kick off your weight loss program. The best way of doing it would be absolutely low carbs. Come down to really, really low carbs. Your weight loss will just be like magic. But after two, three months, you must put back healthy carbs back into your diet. Otherwise, you're asking for trouble because we're not built to, you know, to manage things like that. So we need carbs for many things. Some parts of the brain will not work without carbs and things like that. So you must put in. But for an acute weight loss program, it's great. So many people who come to us will say it's a great idea. Brief time, you can do low carbs, keto diet, but only a brief time. Then you got to go into a more healthy diet. One last it. question from my side uh, is about this VO2 max. You need a lot of importance on VO2 max. And to be honest, I never really thought it was so important until I heard you say it at least five or six times in your talk. So, so you know, can you elaborate a little more on this VO2 max? How do you measure it? How do you achieve this? Oh, yeah. And so, what are your parameters for that? So initially, you know, the sports medicine labs used to be there. And they used to measure for these athletes having various gadgets and all that. Like everything like, you know, Pulse oximetry, for example, now is available on a, on a thing like that. So now VO2 max is available in our fitness devices. So my advice to all orthopedic surgeons here is if you're going to buy a fitness device, the differentiating between a good fitness device and a bad fitness device is the one that measures VO2 max, a good device. It means a high-end device. It's a very important parameter here. Like Siri said yesterday, my VO2 max when I started this was around 25 or so. Now it's uh, 45. So that is your how healthy you are, how good is your cardiorespiratory reserve. Okay. Now we call it to a, we compare it to a horsepower of a car. So, you know, this car has got, you know, brake horsepower of 150 means, you know, that's exactly. So the substitute for that, if you don't have a good device, substitute for the resting heart rate. The resting heart rate comes down and down, your aerobic fitness is going up and up. But that's a very uh, crude way of doing it. Uh, that only measures your heart. Whereas if VO2 measures your heart, your lungs, your capillary system and your muscle. So that's how good you are. Right. So the whole thing gives you a video. So please look at your VO2 max. Now the American Heart Association has said the biggest thing that you can do to prevent heart disease is having a high VO2 max. The liver association has said the best thing you can have to have a good liver is a high VO2 max. So all individual, without understanding the global effect, the policy, they've all come independently and said VO2 max is the key to, to getting a good healthy body. Right. Right. Excellent. Uh, Shinde sir, uh, any comments or questions from your side? My wonderful lecture. Now I am eager to see all his uh, YouTube uh, presentation and then I will ask him question on uh, by email or... Sure sir, sure sir. Anytime. I, I am really impressed by all these things because so many people are uh, telling about 
very different views regarding diet and everything. He has given a clear idea. Now I will go through all the uh, your YouTube's uh, presentation and then I will ask you a question on email. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Anytime. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, you know, really, Vijay, excellent talk. Another statement of yours, which uh, really, I would say, summarizes the whole talk is, unhealthy diet is worse than tobacco or alcohol. You know, so true, so true. You know, we eat sugar, we just add sugar in the tea, coffee, the white sugar, refined sugar, the processed food. You rightly brought it about that, you know, the processed food. I keep biscuits in, you know, my OT uh, room, you know, whenever in between cases, eat, quickly eat two or three biscuits. But I think tomorrow I'm going to check them out. So you should absolutely you should, yeah. <laughs> that is really the key. Small things that we don't give attention to is really the root of the problem. Yeah. yeah. So I think even though you know they brand it as healthy biscuits, but you showed us that they use the refined sugars, which is not a good thing. So I think that really has brought about a huge revolution in my thinking, and I'm sure. Uh, we uh, know from Ashok Sham how many participants we've had, but we had uh, to tell you 450 registrations for this because this is a Maharashtra Medical Council accredited uh, program. We have four points for four Sundays. So we have 450 people surely there because they will get only points at the end if they've attended all through. So 450 are assured and I'm sure Ashok will tell us more. But before we come to the official end, Vijay, let me thank you on a Sunday evening. You gave us time and really appreciate this in spite of your busy schedule. But really, I have seen uh, another facet of yours, more impressive, I would say, than your arthroplasty <laughs> facet, which is, of course, uh, given. But I think if you do something else than uh, what you do uh, for your regular professional career, I think that gives more value. And, and I'm sure this is a hobby and it keeps you busy because you might be all the time reading and updating your knowledge. and that itself, you know, gives you uh, the kick and uh, the inspiration to stay fit. So with that note... Thanks, Parag. Yeah, I think, I think we, just to give you a snapshot, sure. I have a one-hour lecture on statins. I mean, wow. uh, there's no end to it. it uh, it's become, you know, influencing people <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah. uh, something, something like, you know, these big organizations are, are causing so much harm uh, by influencing us the wrong way yeah. that we must all join together and fight this... Uh, this sort of this virus in us. And I have a one hour talk and I actually convert many cardiologists uh, from statins to the other side, actually. But you must be having many enemies now in your hospital or in your <laughs> colleagues who are cardiologists. <laughs> yeah, but what do you do? So I think you have to call a spade a spade. And it's what you spoke is so much evidence-based. You know, you're not just talking rocket science or something because you mm. just feel it's the right way. So I think that's that's so true. And, you know, once it's evidence-based, I'm sure people have to accept it. So thank you so much, Vijay. Before uh, we close, I want to thank uh, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association for giving me an opportunity to be a part of uh, the, the master class series. Thank you, Shinde, sir, and uh, the entire executive committee of MOA. And also this was a part of the bone and joint uh, week celebration of the Indian Orthopedic Association. So thank you, Dr. Shiv Shankar. And last but not the least, uh, you know, uh, Ashok Sham, who has really uh, revolutionized uh, webinars, not only in India, but the whole world where, you know, people are now stuck to Ortho TV, glued to Ortho TV. And he's made it so easy at a click of a button. Your talk can be watched now by more than 25,000 orthopedic surgeons, Vijay, across the globe. Thanks to Ashok Sham and thanks to Ortho TV and Ashok, we are grateful for this and we look forward to more support from you in the future. I still remember the first APAS meeting in Chennai, the Vijay, the meeting which we had. I still remember the nice words you spoke during the dinner we had and gave the importance of Lungi. I remember <laughs> <laughs> how it conveys different meanings and different connotations. But that meeting uh, Ashok Sham had uh, you know, webcasted all through the world. And that was the beginning. And now, you know, since then, you know, it's that is uh, history and uh, what Ashok has done. So congratulations, Ashok. And uh, thank you for all your support through Ortho TV for the masterclass program and other programs too. So thank you. And uh, Shinde, sir, I will request you to conclude and uh, propose a vote of thanks. It, it was a wonderful session. 
all the faculties are excellent and given a nice talk and really i am sure everyone of us are upgraded by their knowledge which is uh, other than routine professional knowledge and fantastic and i really thank parar for introducing such faculties to our association thank you thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you vijay wish you thanks, uh, thanks, a good man. evening ahead see you again thank you thank you sir bye are we offline yeah just i'm switching it off अतिशय चांगला कार्यक्रम झालेला आहे